Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Peterson Florida. I'm a PhD student under the supervision of Marie-Pierre Letourneau Momini and Candido Pormar. Many thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to present the results of my dissertation. The work is entitled Modulation of Bone Mineral Content in Gilts Using a Depletion and Repletion Protocol. For the sake of transparency, the work was the result of a partnership between the Agroscope Institute in Switzerland and University Laval in Canada. And the goal of the project is to update existing guidelines. A little bit of background information by way of introduction. As you well know, phosphorus is an issue that has been around for decades. We have known for a very long time that phosphorus is a key input for pigs, a non-renewable and expensive resource. If this resource runs out, this could jeopardize the lives of future generations. It is also the third most expensive input in pig feed. It has the potential to pollute water ecosystems when it is present in excess concentrations. So what we need is efficient management of phosphorus, and this requires that we optimize usage or reduce excretion to reduce the environmental footprint. In recent decades, several studies have already shown that it's possible to limit the use of phosphorus while maximizing growth performance. For example, a 2018 study by Gonzalo et al. demonstrated that a phosphorus deficiency leads to inadequate bone mineralization, which can be salvaged through a food adaptation period. Along the same lines, in Switzerland, recommended phosphorus allowances have been reduced to maximize growth performance. However, in some farms, when replacement sows are reared alongside fattening pigs until their weight reaches 80 or 100 kilos, the gilt's bone mineralization potential may be compromised, which also compromises its future career as a breeding animal. As a result, to test the impact of such practices on bone mineralization in sows, we decided to test the following assumption. After a depletion period, i.e. a period of reduced digestible phosphorus and calcium in feed, are the gilts able to self-regulate and increase the use of those minerals? Can they offset the resulting bone mineralization deficit if fed adequate phosphorus and calcium levels. That's the repletion period. So this brings me to our materials and methods. So in the trial, we had 24 gilts that were fed a two-phase diet. During phase one, that's the depletion period, the gilts were fed two diets for weights ranging between 60 and 95 kilos. So for phase two, that's the repletion period, weights range between 95 and 140 kilos. So also two diets for phase two, but all four diets are different from each other. All the feeds followed existing Swiss guidelines, except in terms of calcium and phosphorus content. So two D diets during the depletion phase. The first D diet is D60, and it has a low calcium and digestible phosphorus content, meeting only 60% of the calcium and phosphorus requirements. The other depletion diet, D100, covers 100% of the requirements of finishing pigs. For the repletion phase, we have two R diets, including a control diet, R100, which meets 100% of requirements, and a phosphorus rich diet or 160, which meets 160% of the requirements. So a total of 24 gilts assigned to six blocks of four gilts. So during phase one at 60 kilogram, the D60 and D100 diets were randomly assigned to each block with two gilts on D60 and two gilts on D100. At 95 kilos, each D60 gilt was randomly assigned either to a worn 
to a R100 diet or a R160 diet. And this resulted in four different combinations in line with a two by two factorial design. So four different combination treatments, D60 R100, D60 R160, D100 R100 and D100 R160. So each treatment was repeated six times. To study the bone deposition kinetics, we need to look at the whole body bone mineral content. And the L2 and L4 lumbar vertebrae were studied every two weeks using DXA, dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. Depletion data was analyzed in the form of a complete randomized block using the SAS software. Repletion results were analyzed using a two by two factorial design to test the impact of the diets on interaction between the different variables. Results. We have not observed any impact of the diet on the growth performance during either period. Now, DFI, which stands for daily feed intake, and ADG, which stands for average daily gain, are protein depositions and lipid depositions. And none of these four variables were affected by the low phosphorus D60 diet. However, if we look at bone mineralization, this table shows CMOC, that's the whole body BMC, the whole body bone mineral content, and CMOV, which is the bone mineral content of the two vertebrae. So the two gains represent the mineral depositions associated with both CMOC and CMOV. As you can see in the table, during the depletion phase, a 40% reduction in phosphorus content in the D60 diet led to a reduction in both the whole body and the vertebrae bone mineral content. During phase two, at 140 kilogram, the whole body and vertebrae bone mineral content was higher in animals who received the phosphorus-rich R160 diet. However, the phosphorus-depleted animals showed a higher BMD gain than those with no depletion, meaning that they were able to offset their mineralization deficit. This graph looks at the bone kinetics. So the bone mineral density is plotted against the live weight. As you can see, it took two weeks for the phosphorus depletion to set in. Similarly, the BMD was repleted quickly within four to six weeks. However, please note that the phosphorus rich diet R160 gives higher bone mineralization levels than the benchmark diet. Here, you see a highly significant reduction in nitrogen output. In this graph, for example, if we compare it with the benchmark diet, so D100R100, in this study, we see an 8% drop in the depleted group and an increase of 21% and 33% for the two phosphorus-rich R160 diets. If we look at the population composed of 1.5% replacement gilts and 98.5% fattening pigs with a renewal rate of 40% for the gilts, the reduction in requirements becomes more effective with nearly 25% more in the depleted groups versus the non-depleted groups, despite the use of the phosphorus-rich diet. Discussion. A 40% reduction in phosphorus content has no effect on growth performance, but it does reduce bone mineralization this is in line with previous studies, which show that the repletion phase shows that gilts can offset their mineralization deficit with either the R100 or the R160 diet. This is based 
on increased utilization of calcium and phosphorus, as shown by Gonzalo and his team in 2018. Bone mineralization was higher for the phosphorus-rich R160 diets, which suggest that the Swiss guidelines do not match the requirements for maximizing bone mineralization. There is a need to update those guidelines. Lastly, this strategy has led to a 25% reduction in nitrogen output, a result that is in line with the work of Schlegel et al., published in 2020. By way of conclusions, gilts can be reared alongside fattening pigs until the 100 kilo weight mark with less than the recommended dietary intake without deteriorating the growth performance. However, this impacts bone mineralization. The bone mineralization deficit can be offset by a diet with a sufficient phosphorus allowance between 100 and 140 kilos. As shown earlier, this could be the result of better mineral utilization. A depletion slash repletion approach could help reduce nitrogen output. The phosphorus requirements of gilts between 100 and 140 kilos could be higher than the current recommendations. Many thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, I am on hand. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. Uh, alors juste, moi, il y a une première question. Says, Alors, Natalie, je vais basculer en, you, en France. Have a first question. Oui, donc une première question qui vous est... We have a first question, said Natalie. Do you think that the results can be generalized or mainstreamed at every stage or are there are any specific periods in terms of recovery capacity? Yes, that's true. There are specific periods for recovery. If you look at existing literature, pre-existing literature, we find when you have a depletion or repletion period that you, uh, that you apply in the early stages, it's slightly harder for the animals to recuperate. Say depletion takes place between 25 and 50 kilograms as opposed to between 50 and 100. It's two different ball games, two different things. When depletion takes place too early in, in the life of the pig, at too early a stage, then recovery can be extremely difficult. This is important. Thank you for clarifying that, says Natalie, because I have an additional question. Uh, for example, if we stimulate young breeding animals during the growth phase using a depletion repletion sequence, does that mean better efficiency throughout their careers as breeding stock? Not necessarily, huh? You're right, not necessarily. If we look at all of the mobilization aspects, I think that there's no way we could know for sure. There's very little research on the subject. Literature doesn't tell us much. So we, we don't know for sure. In order to get more certainty, we need much more data. We have another question regarding the phosphorus to calcium ratio. Do you have any recommendations for gilts? The P2CA ratio? Well, as part of our experiment, this is what we did. We considered constant ratios, phosphorus to calcium ratios. So we tried to limit the phosphorus intake by also reducing the calcium intake, which meant we avoided altering or deteriorating performance. We even tried to, we even tried to focus on the 100 and 140 kilogram phase so we could recover quick, more quickly. We don't know whether this would translate in the field. Maybe 
Obviously, we're looking at the total calcium over digestible phosphorus calcium ratio. So the, the P to CA ratio is 2.8. That's what we recommend. Thank you very much. One last question, says David. It's a quick one. So let's try to keep the answer quick as well. Did you take into account the, the, the water pH in the trial? No, we did not. But also in Canada, at the beginning of my dissertation, we looked at that. We tried to explore bone bone mobilization, we looked at markers and we didn't find any effect. No effect of the uh, water pH on the level of mobilization. I think we need much more data in order to come up with a conclusion, in order to enjoy more certainty. This is something we have to explore further, clearly. Thank you very much, Peterson. If more questions come up, please respond directly in the chat box. Without further ado, I suggest we hear the second presentation of this afternoon session. It's a presentation by Rafael Gauthier from the Pe Pegas INRAE Joint Research Unit, and he will discuss an algorithm for real-time prediction of daily feed intake, DeFi, in lactating sows. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'd like to present to you a study on an algorithm that is uh, capable of uh, uh, predicting uh, daily feed intake in real time. This was carried out with INRAE. A little bit of background information regarding feeding. Feeding is a key component of pig farming because it has an impact on feeding costs and therefore uh, farm performance. It has an impact on the environment via the effluence discharge into the soil and water. Now, the idea, obviously, in terms of feeding is to adapt uh, nutritional intakes for individual needs. Um, meanwhile, there are different sensors available today that help us collect more data and more mixed data. We have new feeding practices that rely on all of this data in order to personalize and also adjust over time the nutritional intakes. So the idea is to provide just uh, just the right amount of uh, nutrients at the right time. So the goal of precision feeding is to improve sustainability in farming by better using resources, but also using all of these new technologies. Now, if we focus on precision of feeding for lactating sows, previous studies have shown that nutritional requirements are strongly influenced by the sow's appetite and milk output. So a high nutritional needs during lactation and appetite has an influence, milk output as well. On this graph, on the left hand side, you see consumption, rather daily feed intake per lactation day, and you can see that consumption increases. But so does variability over time, over the period. So this is complex and variable. And we need to predict this in order to adjust the ration composition as part of precision feeding efforts. Our previous studies have shown the impact of certain factors such as temperature on sow intake, but there's no existing model that can predict all of this knowledge to predict individual DFI. So that's our objective today, to propose a method that will predict individual intake daily feed intake. So our approach is based on both data sciences and computer sciences, where we're using a clustering approach and prediction of time series. So what is a time series? So in our case, we record, we record the successive uh, uh, intakes for the sow. Clustering methods in data sciences, those are methods, the objective of which is to identify homogeneous groups within a database with no prior knowledge of the nature of these groups. For example, if we take this herd of sows, in our case, we will try to identify feeding trajectories and behaviors that are recurrent in certain sow herds. 
Here, there are three different groups of sows. So this approach requires that we set a parameter. We call it K. That's the number of trajectories that we try to identify in a database. And we have no prior knowledge of the number of feeding behaviors that we are trying to identify. In our approach, we implement clustering techniques through offline learning. For this, we use a large database containing historical data on the herd. And we identify via the clustering approach different prototypes. And each prototype matches a specific feeding behavior within the herd. We use the prototypes during an online prediction phase so parallel to the lactation period. Here, we combine the real-time data on sows with the prototypes already identified offline. Now, step one, we assign a known trajectory to a new sow. Then we predict a time series. In other words, we predict for the next 24 hours, the sow's intake. Then using nutritional applications we use the prediction and at the end of the day thanks to automated systems we are able to record the sow's actual intake so the data used and the methodology as part of the uh, trial regarding the data we put together a database containing 39,000 time series and each time series is composed of 20 intakes registered after farrowing so these 39,000 time series uh, were uh, applied to six different farms regarding offline clustering the k parameter range between two and eight to identify between two and eight different feeding behaviors within our large database of time series so we use the k-shape algorithm which matches the specificities of time series really well in our study and we use two different learning strategies a farm by farm approach so in the first case we use our clustering approach for farm one and then farm two and then farm three, et cetera. And the other strategy is a global learning strategy where we mix the data from all of the farms and we use our clustering approach on this database containing a mixture of time series. So the clustering stage was evaluated using two different indexes, Silhouette on the one hand and kalinsky Harabaz. So we're able to characterize the time series within the cluster. And so they're very different from one cluster to another, but very similar within a single cluster. So for offline prediction, we use three different functions. First, a persistence function, which is completely naive. So no prior learning. It doesn't know the prototypes that we can calculate using the history, the data on the herd. So there has not been a prior learning phase. And then we have a 1F function that uses the prototypes calculated offline. And in real time, it only uses the previous intake of the sow. And then we have the 2F function, which uses offline uh, learning and combines this prototype with the two previous intakes of the sow. At the end of the day, quality of prediction can be evaluated based on different indicators. So the average error per cell, average error per day, and mean error per cell. These are the results of the learning phase. Using the silhouette index, we obtained clusters that were the most homogeneous for k equals 2. So k ranges between 0.16 and 0.22. This indicates proper separation of time series within the database. And for k equals 2, this was confirmed by the use of the second index, which also gave the best values for k equals 2. Now, in terms of the clusters and the uh, prototypes that we can obtain as part of the global learning strategy, when we mix the data from all of the farms, we end up with two different types of clusters. And what do they look like? Well, there's an increase in DVF5 at the beginning of lactation, followed by a steadfast but less uh, significant increase afterwards. And here we have a faster increase at the beginning of lactation, followed by a plateau. 
Now, as part of this a farm by farm learning strategy, we find the exact same type of cluster and the same trajectory as for the learning, the global learning method. Now, moving on to results for online prediction using the different indicators. The mean error per cell was the most interesting in this global clustering strategy, uh, coupled with a prediction function that used the last two intakes of each cell. So the mean error per cell is centered on zero kilogram per day. And we find that with our persistent naive function, which does not use acquired knowledge on the herd's history data, the error shows that the actual cell intake is greatly underestimated to the tune of 300 grams per day with this function. Now, if we look at the same error dynamically, our persistent function is heavily impacted at the start of suckling, but then tends towards zero over time. In the other strategies throughout the suckling period, the error is more centered on zero, which is what we want. Now, the downside of a mean error is that the errors can offset each other day after day. So we use the mean squared error to approach the prediction quality from a different angle. The method that comes out as having the lowest error is the farm by farm clustering method in association with a prediction function that uses the cells to previous intakes at the time of prediction. So the error is 1.06 kilogram per day. Now, the persistent method by way of comparison presented a higher mean squared error, about 1.21 kilogram per day. If we look at this error over time, as a percentage of the actual intake to be predicted over time, we find that our methods based on prototypes and clusters show a a lower error at the start of suckling, but from PND8 or 10, the MSC or mean squared error tends to converge with the with uh, the error obtained with the persistent function. So, discussion and conclusion. As part of this large database, uh, we have shown feeding trajectories that were few but recurring from one farm to another. We have uh, an intake level that is specific to each farm and each farm's performance level. And we have a prediction method that is based on recent intakes of the sow, but also on its feeding behaviors. And this has been identified in the history, the data of the farm. Now, variability in daily intake remains high, and this can be regular and or random and could be studied further with a view to improving the prediction method. Lastly, this is an approach that requires little IT resource and it can be used as part of precision feeding efforts so as to so as to adapt the ration composition based on sow appetite. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Raphael. Moving on to the Q&A. Okay. Experts talking to experts. The first question comes from an expert are you planning to uh, are you planning to have the clustering based models uh, uh, be be evaluated by experts in addition to the unsupervised approach thank you very much for this question now k ranges from two to eight in addition to this approach we add knowledge on uh, feed intake and feeding behavior based on expert knowledge so we have different indicators and ideally, we need to divide the database into two different feeding behaviors. But that's just an indicator. That's just one index and we need to add to it. We need to uh, also consider the expert opinions. Thank you very much. That's an excellent transition for the second question, which has to do with uh, intake patterns. Is there a correlation with certain phenotypes or genotypes? Unfortunately, in our database, there is no information on sow genetics or parity. Well, there was information, but considering how large the database that we needed to toy with, sometimes there was little data, sometimes it was not reliable enough in order for us to aggregate the data and be able to learn from it. So the answer is no. A uh, part of the rearing effect, maybe, maybe could this be due to 
differences in the feeding value of the equipment, we don't have information on that criterion. What we do know is that the average intake level is different for farm to farm. So the clustering based method made it possible for us to put together feeding behaviors that was that was that basically had the same average value. One last question. What equipment was necessary in order to monitor intake? Well, we used Gestel Quattro equipment sourced in Canada. This is equipment that uh, makes daily recordings. You can own daily recordings for each meal. Every time the, t the sows feed, we get information. So the precision level was what? One kilo? I know this is a very practical approach, but one kilo is about is, is a little more than 10%. So to what extent does it have a large impact if we want to set up precision feeding systems? Well, what's interesting here is that on average, throughout the lactation period, the, you have a predicted and actual uh, average uh, intake that are the same. Now, as far as uh, daily variations are concerned, or rather daily intake, sometimes it's simply due to variability within the cell. It's something we don't understand yet or are not able to capture, but there's something regular about it. And maybe we need to add to our approach in order to ascertain that and reduce the discrepancy, but the average intake is reliable. The observation matches the prediction. And so our profile works. Now, I don't think that this is the right criteria or check-in for errors on a daily basis. If there's an excess one day, maybe it's not used right away, but it can be used at a later stage. So doing this on a daily basis, that, that may be a little too strict. But the opposite could be true as well. If we estimate, if our, if we overestimate the feed intake one day, and then the next day, the intake is lower, the two days offset each other. Obviously, there is significant variability. Did you try and aggregate several consecutive days in order to reduce variability? We do know that sows compensate from one day to another. They eat more one day, reduce your intake the next day. This leads to a lot of variation. Did you try doing that over two, three days? Are you talking about cumulative intake data or averaged out over two, three days? The answer is yes. We did that at a particular stage in the process. On average, we fell. We fell back on intake data, but the the DFI, as a predicted, matched the actual observation. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have other opportunities to discuss this further. Thank you, says David. So many thanks for your presentation and for answering these questions. Uh, now I suggest we move on to the next presentation, and that is going to be a summary presented by Jean-Yves Dourmade, looking at changes in nutritional concepts and feeding methods for breeding sows. So looking at history and prospects for research. Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce this synthesis on the evolution of nutritional concepts in feeding methods for breeding cows. The objective of our work is not only to give you a quick reminder of the concepts and the approaches that we've been using in the last few in the past years to reason sow feeding, but also to show you how recently acquired the scientific knowledge regarding uh, sow nutrition may be used to develop uh, decision-making tools that can be used in breeding farms 
especially in order to develop uh, precision feeding. I have prepared this work with my colleagues, uh, Charlotte Gaillard and Raphael Gauthier. I organized my presentation in seven items. We're going to focus on a number of things that I believe are important to show you the history of these approaches and to look at future perspectives. You have the list of the items on this slide and we're going to take them one by one. The vast increase in uh, reproductive performances is possibly one of the most striking uh, phenomena we have been uh, witnessing in the last years. These evolutions have had uh, pronounced effects on the cell performance. For instance, prolificacy has been increased by 50%, but this went along with the increased needs for fetal development, especially in the later stages of gestation. It also induced an increase in the needs for milk production, which has risen by 70% over the same period. In most um, lineages, breeding lineages, we've observed that the weight of cells has also increased, which means also that the maintenance needs have increased. However, their appetite has remained stable, which means that there is a danger of uh, cells becoming depleted during lactation. This has also led to an increased variability for a number of biological parameters, and uh, therefore all needs have changed and there is great variation between individuals depending on their prolificacy, their appetite, between feeding farms, depending on the animal's uh, genetic origin, the housing uh, technique, and also the uh, climate based on geographical area, seasons, etc. Mammals uh, need uh, body reserves uh, to protect their offspring from nutritional deficits. There are homeoresis and homeostasis me me mechanisms that are to uh, build reserves during gestation and use them during lactation. Now, body reserve use is something that is often found in bibliography. In the 80s, people started talking about the uh, thin sow syndrome. And then in the 90s, we started talking about fat sow syndromes, which led to peripartum issues. And more recently, we've started talking about the accordion sow syndrome. Now, there is an optimum level of uh, adipose tissues reserves, and it shouldn't be just enough for milk production, but there should not be too much uh, fat because this may lead to uh, problems uh, during um, farrowing. Uh, and at weaning, there should be enough uh, reserves to uh, protect from reproductive issues. And there, there is uh, an equivalent importance for lipid and protein reserves. Now, we may think that uh, reproductive performance depends on a tripod nutritional intake, body reserves, and the uh, cell's uh, productivity. The body reserve may be uh, measured with indicators such as uh, back fat thickness, which is an indicator for reserves, and nutritional intake will help uh, balance the system based on these uh, information, on these data. Now, concepts and methods uh, used uh, to determine the uh, SARS nutritional needs have changed recently. Until the mid 80s, uh, we used uh, empirical relationships between uh, performances and uh, intake, nutritional intake based on short or long term studies. But it was difficult to uh, come to conclusions based, based to the, the uh, high variability of parameters. At the time, there were big differences in the uh, guidelines and recommendations between countries. As of the 90s, uh, we have started developing analytical approaches, factorial approaches based on needs quantification and measurements of the uh, efficiency with which nutrients were used to meet the uh, needs and energy expense which led to models for needs prediction, energy, amino acids, and also IT tools were developed and progressively they replaced the uh, recommendation tables, such as the uh, NRC tools uh, or the in-report tools. Recently, we have uh, witnessed a progressive evolution towards precision, so-called precision feeding, uh, based on uh, smart feeding systems, uh, which have been developed, and the use of sensors uh, that allow to make uh, direct measurements on the animals. Similarly, concepts to assess um, 
nutrient value have uh, changed. For energy, we've moved from the ED or EM system towards net energy systems using very specific values uh, adapted to SOUS. For amino acids, uh, starting in the early 90s, we have been using uh, standardized ileal digestibility as a parameter using values that were measured in growing pigs because uh, well for lack of anything else that could be used for cells for minerals uh, di fecal di apparent fecal digestibility or standardized systems have progressively replaced the uh, system based on total phosphorus and for phosphorus, we have started using uh, measured values that are measured in the growing pig. For calcium, we still use uh, total uh, intake as well as for metal trace elements. But more recently, work has shown that we might be able to use in the future a system based on calcium digestibility to be used on sows. And this is obviously important uh, for phosphorus. We work with microbial phytases. In the 90s, we have seen the first uh, model approaches uh, regarding the need uh, for energy and the uh, energy uh, used by cells. Uh, here we have a model based on compartments, body proteins, uh, body lipids, uh, and energy flows and nutrients flows. Energy and nutrients are used to cover the uh, priority needs, uh, maintenance, uh, physical exercise, uh, uterus maintenance, milk production, and everything in excess will be used to uh, build up uh, body reserves. If there is a deficit, a depletion, like during lactation, the body reserves will be used to uh, compensate for uh, the uh, intake deficit. Body uh, lipids and body proteins are used to predict uh, live weight and uh, back fat thickness, which is used to manage feeding. Some factors will have an impact on the uh, use of energy during gestation, such as weight, physical exercise, uh, environmental temperature, and uh, maintenance needs, the size of the litter, the stage of gestation. All of these parameters will influence the needs for uh, uterine development, and body reserves will be divided between uh, protein deposition, uh, the, uh, depending on the parity, the stage of gestation, and during lactation, the live weight will influence the maintenance needs, and milk production will be influenced by the size of the litter and the stage of lactation. And finally, body reserves are usually uh, mobilized at, at, at that time and can be predicted based on the animal's appetite and milk production. Protein retention can be predicted based on a response curve, as you can see on this slide regarding gestation. The nitrogen balance depends on the parity, on the uh, stage of gestation, the energy intake, and the size of the litter. For lactation, the uh, nitrogen balance is usually negative, and it depends on amino acid intakes, the daily weight gain for the litter, and the energy balance. Now, these models have been used to develop uh, decision-making tools, uh, such as the in-report tool. Among those tools, uh, we find that the uh, cells are represented based on their parity to characterize performances, uh, feeding uh, habits, and housing techniques, so that a uh, standardized, a typical uh, cell profile can be determined for that particular farm. Then the profile is used to calibrate the model in such a way that the model will be used to predict the uh, breeding farm's performances accurately. And the tool can also be used to calculate the sow's needs based on a factorial approach, either based on the farm itself or on each sow individually in such a way that the needs can be defined. But the same model can also be used to simulate performances. Bearing in mind uh, that there can be a very specific feeding plan and answering questions such as what happens if I change the uh, lysine intake in my uh, lactation feed diet. Simulations also allow to predict evolution in the weight and uh, back fat thickness, and uh, it helps uh, define uh, limitations in the intake or excessive intake, because this can also be helpful to better fine tune the needs. We can also determine the average need for the true source based on parity. Here we see the need for metabolizable energy, depending on the parity, with a spread between maintenance needs, uh, physical exercise needs, thermal regulation, uh, litter, and uh, building up of body reserves. We can also calculate 
the need for amino acids. Here we see the need for digestible lysine at the, uh, in the early stages of gestation in green and at the end of gestation in blue. The same goes for uh, the uh, cell's needs during lactation. On the left-hand side, we see the changes in the uh, energy needs depending on parity and the spread between maintenance, needs for maintenance and needs for litter production. And on the right-hand side, we have the need uh, for amino acids. We also are able to use uh, the model for a dynamic representation. Here we have metabolizable energy during gestation on the left-hand side and your lactation on the right-hand side graph. We can also use this to show dynamically the contribution to uh, the various expenses to the total needs. Now, taking in consideration variability of the needs is uh, very important because it helps fine-tune the average uh, need of each animal, and uh, it also helps uh, develop uh, precision feeding methods. Indeed, needs may uh, vary according to the potential, such as genetic potential or housing conditions. It also depends on the cells, individual performance, weight, age, body condition, and the needs may change over time, depending on the stage of gestation and the stage of lactation. This was recently uh, worked on uh, by Charlotte Gaillard and Raphael Gauthier uh, in our team. They uh, worked uh, on the following assumption. They wanted to start from the nutritional model we have just described and then connect the model to databases which are available in the farms in order to characterize individually each cell based on parity, age, live weight, back fat, thickness, uh, size of parity, growth of parity, oh, size of litter, growth of litter, ingestion, temperature, and also characterizing the place uh, with information such as temperature. The information is then used by the model in order to, organ to calculate dynamically with a daily uh, time unit, the nutritional nutrition needs for each animal. This is a new model paradigm, uh, somewhere between data and decision-making. We could call it data ready or precision feeding ready. We have been using the same model in order to assess individual variability in the needs of gestating sows based on the data from a breeding farm housing 2,500 sows. We see, for instance, that energy needs for gestating sows change depending on the parity here we have different colors according to the parity, uh, but within the same parity uh, level, we have uh, differences that depend on the, the individual characteristics, uh, weight, back thickness, back fat thickness, etc. Similarly, for digestible lysine needs expressed here in grams per kilograms at the end of gestation, we observed a reduction in the needs uh, depending on parity, but within the same parity level, there may still be variability, which may be due to individual characteristics uh, of each individual cell and also the performance level expressed, in, especially by their prolificacy. Based on the same information, we have uh, shown on this slide the uh, evolution uh, regarding uh, digestible lysine and digestible phosphorus needs during gestation. We see here the average and the variability of said needs. We observe an increased need as uh, gestation progresses and uh, also increased in the variability of the needs. There is another way to illustrate uh, needs variability. We can show the percentage of uh, sows whose needs are covered depending on the uh, feed content. This was done here regarding digestibilizing needs for four different batches of animals. Multiparous uh, sows uh, in early gestation, red. Uh, primiparous uh, sows uh, early gestation in blue multiparous uh, sows end of gestation in green and primiparous sows uh, end of gestation in purple. This allows us to define the need or say the uh, intake needed to cover the needs of 90% of sows. We observe that depending on the uh, sow category, the need may vary 
ranging from less than three grams per kilo for the multiparous cells in early gestation to more than five grams per kilo for, for primiparous, uh, primiparous cells at the end of gestation. Same approach was adopted uh, for lactating cells based on data drawn from two different farms for a population of 1,450 cells or lactations. Left-hand side graph, the uh, energy needs expressed in megajoules of metabolizable energy per day are largely dependent on uh, the litter growth. Residual variability is due to the variability in the cell's weight because that may have an influence on maintenance needs. But if we look at the energy balance, we find that the energy balance is uh, strongly influenced or dependent on feed intake. Similarly, we have observed the same thing in both farms. The few cells that have a positive energy balance, I guess those are cells which are not very productive or have a strong appetite, but usually the cells will find themselves in a negative balance energy balance situation. Based on the same data, we have uh, shown uh, individual variability in digestible energy needs, elisin needs expressed in grams per kilograms of feed. And um, we find that there is a great variability between animals and the variability seems to increase in the farm B versus farm A. Part of the variability may be accounted for by uh, litter growth, which is an indicator but the rest of variability could be due to uh, feed intake by the animals. And again, we can use the data to, in order to define the needs in such a way that we make sure that the uh, needs of part of the population are covered. This can be seen here when we calculate the need in such a way that we cover 80% of the sow's needs and we find here that uh, parity has significant effect. Three, parity three and uh, more have uh, weaker, lower needs and uh, intermediate for rank two and parity one has the greatest uh, needs. Precision feeding means that every day, every sow gets a feed that matches its needs. And this opens new uh, avenues to improve uh, feed efficiency or feed conversion, but while reducing the cost of feed and environmental impact. This is made possible by new technologies now available to collect real-time data and to distribute customized feeding and nourishment to the animals based on different types of feeds. It, when used in real time, these models uh, match the approach and based on data collected by the breeder, thanks to a few sensors, decisions can be made regarding quantity and composition of the feed to be distributed to the animals and the decisions are then implemented by the automatic uh, feeding system. The first uh, simulation results are quite promising for gestating sows rather than using a one-phase strategy precision feeding uh, has uh, decreased the total uh, protein intake by 24 percent reduction in the nitrogen excretion and the four percent decrease of the cost of feeding but this uh, finding needs to be confirmed this brings us to the last part of my presentation conclusions and perspectives Sow feeding has uh, been through a number of uh, very pronounced uh, changes in the last few years. Genetic improvement has influenced uh, the needs levels, but also changed the uh, biological aspect of the relationship between biology, uh, genetics and production. This was made possible because we have acquired the scientific knowledge, we have uh, acquired new concepts and uh, new data. The relationship between nutrition and reproduction is now better understood. And we understand the need for balance between uh, reserves, performance and feeding. And this balance can be oriented by using the body condition as an indicator and the feed intake as a control tool. During the same period, the uh, systems to assess feeds 
and diets have uh, evolved. And in 2004, INRA AFZ tables were published. Now, these tables have supplied uh, digestibility, allele digestibility levels for amino acids and also fecal digestibility of phosphorus and net energy values, which are specifically oriented towards uh, breeding cells. But the calculation methods for nutritional needs have also changed. Starting in the 90s, uh, we have the uh, factorial calculation methods for needs. And in the years 2000, we have started developing uh, IT-based calculation methods and models. More recently, decision real-time decision-making tools connected to the uh, breeding farm data, to the sensors and to the smart feeding systems have also been developed. What about the future? There will be new challenges. And they will be increasingly important because uh, obviously breeding is uh, now uh, raising issues uh, regarding sustainability and acceptability by society. And therefore, we need to pay attention to animal welfare, health, environment, climate changes. On the other hand, we also have seen uh, new uh, specific labels appearing, uh, GMO free, no deforestation, no additives, uh, organic breeding methods. And these changes are going to lead to changes in the way the farms are managed, the housing also, and the way the animals are being fed, especially breeding to sows. But this means that we have to acquire more scientific knowledge, for instance, to uh, use the recommendations and the models and uh, adapt them to new production uh, situations. It is increasingly true that in the future, data models, machine learning, uh, breeding farm networks will play an essential, a more essential role, for instance, for breeding farm management in the context of uh, precision feeding, but also in order to produce new knowledge based on uh, farm derived data. Possibly a large part of the new knowledge will be produced in the future directly from the uh, breeding farm networks and maybe less based on animal experiments because these are now being questioned by society. I thank you for your attention and obviously uh, your questions are welcome. Thank you, Jean-Yves. If you could switch on your video and microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have time for four questions. Well, I'm going to summarize the first two because they are similar. Nutritional needs calculations. Is it possible to take in consideration, do we have the knowledge? Uh, can we take in consideration the yield for uh, energy and uh, amino acids? Well, we take in consideration very specific yields for each nutrient. And in the new, in the latest um, version of the uh, calculation methods, which were published in the Journal of Science for gestation and lactation, Charlotte and Raphael were the authors. We have uh, developed calculation methods based on specific yield for each amino acid. In the past, we uh, talked about ideal proteins. Now we change a little bit, but still not a big change. For energy, yields have remained unchanged independently of the uh, type of sow, genetic origin, parity. But that kind of information is very difficult to produce. So we might be able to do it in the future, maybe indirectly by using databases. I hope that we will be able to collect the databases from the breeding farms in order to make comparisons and see what is being done versus what is being predicted by the model so that we can uh, estimate the gap and maybe calculate uh, residual efficiency as was done in the growing pigs so that it would be a way to improve the data available. Another question on data acquisition, historical data regarding a specific cell, can they be used for the next lactation or the next gestation in order to improve a need prediction? Well, that's important. So far in the databases we've been using, it proved to be quite difficult to use the information again, because sometimes it's difficult to connect the uh, information for the same sound for the next gestation. And obviously, sometimes we don't have uh, enough data. I mean, the, the period is relatively limited. 
However, it would be a uh, interesting if we were able to do it because yes, there is probably a, a good re uh, reproducibility in the parameters, for instance, prolificacy, and it's also true for other criteria such as milk production or maybe appetite during lactation. So we could possibly improve prediction by uh, using historical data and taking it into consideration. But it means we have to have the databases over the long period. And uh, obviously, the data has to be entered into the database. So we have to have the kind of data we're looking for and on a sufficient population. And that, I believe, is what we're missing. Rather than methods, it's that sort of data that we're missing, not the idea, but the, uh, the raw material. OK, the next question, I'm also going to uh, summarize two questions regarding sensors, uh, equipment to phenotype the SARS, and then uh, feed the data into the models to estimate the needs and the possibility of using two different feeds during lactation in real time, or at different periods, uh, successively at different times, but in, in succession. Regarding sensors, we do already have information regarding captors. It's not always easy to have sensors that are robust enough to uh, operate correctly. For instance, assessing uh, the, uh, the the weight is not always easy. You have to calibrate the, uh, the scales. You have to maintain them. We think that maybe in the future, using video and images to estimate the weight might be a very promising way because we don't need a very accurate estimate um, value. An estimate would be enough. And regarding uh, the uh, animal's uh, body condition, well, uh, back fat thickness is a good type of information, but not very easy to acquire. Again, we might be able to use 3D imaging uh, in order to assess back fat thickness. They do it for milking cows, dairy cows. But do we have to wait for this kind of uh, information to be available before we start? I don't think so, because we have seen that in during gestation, needs will change depending on the parity and the stage of gestation. So that kind of in the information we already have can be used to uh, better adjust the nutrients uh, and the, the diet distributed to the animals every day. We can mix two types of feeds, for instance, for lactation, the same holds true. We already have systems that allow us to um, feed in information regarding uh, nutrient intake into the system, and we have shown that consumption prediction works. It's almost better than we expected. However, it is difficult to predict uh, litter growth and milk production. That's more difficult because the size of the litter does not necessarily account for 100% of the variability, 40, 50% at most. The rest is simply due to the animal's uh, characteristics. But we can make progress already. One last question, a very short uh, answer, if you if you'll allow me. Well, there were two questions really in the last one. OK, then there was a, a question in English. There was a question, uh, is there a reference to establish the needs during lactation? Well, both for lactation and gestation, we have published a new version of the models in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Both papers were published in 2020 in the Journal of Animal Science. So you can find them there. All the equations are there, the whole process has been published. It's been published in French in during the uh, Journée de la Recherche pour Cine, the same uh, seminar last year. Well, thank you very much, Jean-Yves. Thank you for a beautiful presentation and for the answers you provided. And I uh, would like to now to move on to the next presentation, Cindy Le Bourgo from Terios. And she's going to tell us about the effect of perinatal supplementation oligosaccharide, short-chain oligosaccharide on the piglet performance. Bonjour à tous, je suis Cindy Le Bourgo, scientifique en nutrition chez Tereos. Et Good je... uh, afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Cindy Le Bourgo, and today I'd like to introduce to you the results of a study 
on the effects of perinatal short-chain fruto-oligosaccharides supplementation on the quality of colostrum and the formation of the intestinal microbiota and its a consequence on piglet growth performance. Pre- and postnatal periods are critical for piglet development because various systems fall into place, such as the microbiota, GI function, and the immune system. At birth, the piglet's immune system is immature because the cell's epithelial corial placenta limits the transfer of maternal immune factors to colostrum in milk. So passive immunity is brought by colostrum and milk during the lactation period. In addition to passive immunity, gradual colonization of the digestive tract by the microbiota plays an important role in postnatal maturation of the immune system. Such bacterial colonization depends on different factors of maternal origin. For example, the mother's uh, environment, uh, feed, and also the composition of the colostrum and milk. There are other environmental factors that can impact the uh, microbiota in the first days of life. For example, antibiotics treatment, pig genetics, and of course, nutritional intake. One of the nutritional strategies to modulate the intestinal microbiota is the use of prebiotic fibers as a feed supplement. These are defined as feeding ingredients that are non-digestible and that specifically modulate the composition and or the activity of the GI microbiota, which brings benefits for health. Now, among recognized prebiotics, we find and the SCFOS, these are soluble fibers from beet sugar obtained following an enzyme reaction. So the degree of polymerization is low between three and five. This ingredient has a guaranteed constant uh, composition. So there's one glucose connected one, two, three or four molecules of fructose. The goal of this study is to evaluate the effects of perinatal short-chain fructo-oligosaccharide or SCFOS supplementation on the quality of colostrum and the formation of the intestinal microbiota and evaluate its consequences on piglet growth performance. Now, for this to happen, we use 30 cells to read up between three different groups. So one control group and two uh, other groups that were supplemented in SAFOS at two different ratios. So the first group had the 10 cells with 0.15% of SAFOS during the first a week of gestation and 0.1% during the first week of uh, lactation. Now for the second group, the dose was slightly higher, 0.33% at the end of gestation and 0.15% at the beginning of lactation. So weaning at 23 days and they all receive a standard uh, commercial diet. And they were monitored until PND 67 stools were collected from both sows and piglets at PND2. Colostrum and milk samples were also taken. We started out by analyzing the nutritional composition of the colostrum and milk from the cell. SCFOS supplementation led to an increase in dry matter content in the colostrum as well as its protein content, irrespective of the dose administered conversely. This reduced the lactose content, but the fat content remained unchanged. There was no compositional change that was observed in the milk collected at uh, day two and day 23. In parallel, we compare the immune qualities of colostrum and milk. And interestingly, we showed an increased IgG concentration in the colostrum of T1 cells and an increased concentration in TGF beta 1, transforming growth factor beta-1, which is an immunoregulatory cytokine in the colostrum of T2 cells. Now, IgA concentration was not significantly impacted by the SCFOS supplementation, although we did find a numerical increase of IgA in the colostrum. So all of these results indicate that SCFOS intake by cells during the last week of gestation tends to improve the nutritional composition and the immune properties of colostrum. 
We then evaluated the bacterial promo colonization of piglet gut. Now, to do this, we determined both the composition and fermentation activity of the sow and piglet microbiota at PND2. Now, the results show rather limited differences from group to group in terms of sow microbiota composition at PND2. So one of the uh, differences observed is the reduction in the uh, Campylobacteria uh, family with SCFOS supplementation in the T1 group. This bacterial family was identified as a family that contains certain pathogenic species. So a reduction in the molecules family was also obtained in the T2 uh, group, and this family was shown as being modulated following metabolic changes. And this indicates that the SCFOS consumption or intake may have impacted cell metabolism. Conversely, fermentation activity of the intestinal microbiota was significantly impacted by SCFOS supplementation, particularly in the T1 group. There was an increase in the total concentration of short chain uh, fatty acids, and this is due to a higher acetate and butyrate concentration. In piglets, Changes in bacterial composition show in a more pronounced way than in the mother. We have shown that SCFOS supplementation in cells led to a significant increase in certain species from the Lactobacillus family. Now, these bacteria are considered as beneficial for health. Uh, they can produce uh, antimicrobial uh, compounds uh, or increase uh, mucin production in the GI tract to limit uh, colonization of the GI tract by pathogens. In parallel, the increase in the peptostreptococcusia group was observed following maternal supplementation in SCFOS. Interestingly, this bacteria could also play a part in the GI tract's barrier function and limit inflammation or the or the emergence of colitis. Other bacterial groups have been reduced in the T1 group. This is the case for Phascolarcobacterium and succinative sense. This has plays a part in energy uh, meta metabolism. Now these changes seem to be beneficial for piglet health because the profile is favorable to protecting the intestinal barrier, and this is part of the defense mechanism. Interestingly, we observed similar bacterial profiles between sows and piglets. This is particularly true for the Campylobacteriaceae and Enterobacteriaceae families, which contain pathogenic species, and these are reduced with SCFOS supplementation. This can be seen both in sows and in their piglets. Conversely, the Peptostreptococcus and Lactobacteria C tend to increase thanks to SCFOS um, supplementation. So these, these bacteria are seen as good bacteria. Now, these differences are merely numerical and non-significant. However, this seems to suggest that there has been a microbiota transfer from the sow to the piglet at birth, which impacts primocolonization of the newborn gut. So it seems possible to positively modulate early colonization of the piglet microbiota using a CFOS supplementation in the sow's diet. Regarding the sow's growth performance data, a supplementation did not change our back fat thickness or weight or farrowing time. However, there was an increase in lactation efficiency. This is the percentage of, metabol the percentage of energy metabolized by the sows and used for piglet growth and maintenance. In parallel, in piglets, a non-significant numerical increase in birth weight and weaning weight was observed, mostly for the T2 group. We also saw a reduced mortality during lactation, which led to a higher number of weaners in the T2 group. These early changes led to a significant improvement in FCR after weaning in both groups of uh, piglets and sows 
who had received a CFOS supplementation. By way of conclusion, a CFOS supplementation in cells at the end of gestation and during lactation helps improve efficiency of lactation in cells, helps modulate the GI microbiota in cells, and so the early formation of this microbiota in uh, in piglets. So this helps the quality of colostrum and increases passive immunity. All of these changes seem beneficial in terms of uh, stimulating piglet growth. There's a reduction in mortality during the lactation period, followed by an improvement in piglet growth after weaning. The use of prebiotics, particularly SCFOSs, in pig farms is a nutritional strategy that is both convenient and effective for improving piglet health during those critical stages in their development. Birth, winning, that's a way to optimize piglet growth. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. I am on hand. Thank you. We do have questions coming in. Um, for example, comparing the results obtained between the two doses, depending on the criterion, the maximum effect is obtained with one option or the uh, other, and the response is different between the sow and the piglet. So do you have an explanation for this? Also, looking at the circumstances under which the results were obtained, the feed composition and the uh, fiber content in the cell's diet, is that a criterion can, that can influence the, the results observed? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this question. Now, the fiber content was comparable from one feed to another. The only difference was the SCFOS supplementation or the use of maltodextrin, which is fully digestible, contrary to SCFOS, which is not digestible. Now, in terms of response to the dose, now for some parameters, we find that there is the lowest dose that responds, and we did not expect that at all. It's particularly the case for IgGs, for example, in colostrum. We, we can't explain that. And also, we see that in the group that received the highest dose, we're not seeing this increase in IgG. So we don't have an explanation for that. What we do find, however, is that for other parameters, uh, usually it's the highest dose that shows the most significant impact. For example, for TGF-beta-1, also in colostrum. Now, now, in terms of piglet growth, after weaning, we find that there is no difference depending on the dose administered uh, to the sow as part of their diet. Um, we did note that uh, the feeds are comparable. But uh, did you use feeds that had more fiber in them? Yes, there's a little bit of fiber. Those are standard, standard diets. There's a little bit of fiber in it. I can't, I can't tell you exactly what the exact concentration is. Thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off. I'm the bad guy here. But in order for us to stick to the time constraints, we have to move on to the next topic. So if further questions come in for you, Cindy Rebogo, please respond uh, in the chat box. Thank you very much. See you soon. Moving on to the next topic, or the next or the last presentation of this uh, uh, session. It's a summary. And we will look at the role of nutrition in cell lameness. This is a presentation by Mireille Huard from the Tobus Company. Bonjour à tous. Je tiens tout d'abord à afternoon. I would like to thank the organizing committee for having given me the opportunity to introduce a synthesis regarding the role of nutrition on lameness in sows. And I would like to thank uh, Karen Bideking, my colleague, because she compiled the data for this uh, study. The synthesis was uh, introduced for the first time during a forum organized by Novus regarding Nutrition for Hyperprolific Sows uh, 2020 in Dusseldorf. We're going to look at the background when lameness appear in, uh, appears in sows, and then we'll talk about what we can do. We will assess lameness with different uh, measurement methods, and we will determine the role played by nutrition to solve uh, the issues. 
and we will look at the various nutritional aspects. Following reproductive problems, uh, lameness are the, uh, mo the most frequent issue uh, observed in sows, especially in the early stages of the sows' career. Here we have 20% of the reasons for culling the animal with a zero parity. In France, 15% of culling due to lameness in early uh, stages of career, and in other countries, in other studies, 6%. The there are several consequences. Uh, cold uh, sows because uh, of lameness are removed from the uh, herd at a younger age and therefore they produce less litters. The turnover rate is uh, greater, although we know that in order to compensate for the uh, turnover cost of a kilt, it should produce at least three litters. And uh, obviously, uh, this may lead to uh, piglets being crushed, and there is an economic loss due to the fact that they have uh, less value on the market. Regarding the sanitary issues, lameness increases inflammatory processes in the affected animal. Here, we have, for instance, we have acute phase proteins with higher levels in lame animals, which may also uh, give rise to other infections and lead to loss of appetite or even anorexia, which may in turn have an impact on reproductive performances. Finally, lameness will generate pain, and pain is obviously uh, bad for the animal's well-being and may lead to changes in the social behavior, and also the breeder's uh, well-being may be affected. Osteochondrosis is one of the main causes for uh, lameness in sows as well as uh, jointed degenerative diseases, especially in young sows in gilts. The disease is due to the fact that the uh, cartilage show growth place may be uh, altered and the secondary uh, phenomena may affect the bones. There are several ways to explain osteochondrosis, genetic origin, housing, feed, the composition, the speed of growth and mechanical or trauma induced stress. The connection between lameness and osteochondrosis is not shown systematically in all cases because part of the osteochondrosis uh, uh, issues may uh, subside uh, naturally and disappear. So we have to think about the combination of several lesions uh, that will lead to the point of no return, whereby the uh, lameness will become permanent. There is a window of susceptibility during which uh, nutrients uh, and feeding may play a role. The second uh, main uh, cause for lameness uh, is injury to the feet, the, the limbs and especially the feet and the hooves. There may be a very variable causes and high incidence, but again, there is not a systematic correlation with lameness. Here we have PREMS study in 2013, 96% of the uh, sows had uh, hoof lesions, but only 6% were lame. We know that uh, the frequency of the lesions and injuries will increase with parity, more often observed on hind limbs versus uh, front limbs, uh, and uh, on the lateral hooves more than the median hoof. The uh, injury is not easy to measure. There may be different type of uh, injuries uh, with a different level of seriousness. According to the literature, there seems to be a connection between uh, lameness and the uh, hoof injury. When the uh, hooves uh, are damaged on the heel, the wall, the white line, but uh, not uh, when the sole uh, heel area is affected. Lameness is defined as altered alteration in the movement or deviation in the normal gait. It may be observed visually, and the most frequent way to describe lameness uh, consists in using a scoring system, five points. Uh, this is the main uh, at all uh, scale, but there are others. There may also be posture abnormalities, as Grégoire showed in his study in 2013. 64% of the lame sows also had adopted a, a, an arched back attitude. There also 
is the possibility to observe uh, hoof injuries uh, and connect them with possible uh, locomotion issues, but not necessarily lameness. These measurements are relatively easy to use, but they need uh, people to be trained and there is not much repeatability, uh, reproducibility. And also the connection with osteochondrosis is not necessarily established. And again, the problem is that there is not necessarily the possibility to repeat the same uh, measurements uh, for the same uh, observer. Now, uh, hoof can be measured with a durometer, and this is used here on uh, cows in 2015. Healthy animals had uh, hoof uh, which uh, had durometer values uh, higher, and uh, here we can improve uh, the um, health and uh, with the fattening pigs in 2015, Zao et al. Uh, measured uh, the uh, hooves to see whether they were hard enough in five measurement points. And the fact that the uh, hoof was less hard was connected uh, to a lower score, except for area number one, at the tip of the hoof where we we found that uh, hardness tended to decrease with the uh, an increase in the lameness score 36.8 in the uh, healthy animals to around about 30 with the highest lameness scores among the dynamic measurements there are force plates that allow you to measure paw by paw the force exerted on each paw, so it's easier to identify on which paw the animal is not, on which limb the animal is not resting uh, its weight. And we were able to perform measurements and to find that the hind limbs were more frequently affected than the fore limbs, and that lameness uh, usually uh, increased the weight borne by the front legs, which then led to an increased seriousness of the injury in the white line, and this led to a decrease in the hoof hardness. In order to conclude regarding the comparison between physical and visual methods to assess lameness, Bauer has come forward with this measurement system called BIPED. Different markers uh, will allow us to assess the situation. First of all, B, balance. I, for investigation. Or P, because we can use the measurements to make a prognosis and see whether, a, and E, whether the treatment will be e efficient, and D, for diagnosis. If all these physical methods that have been used with the uh, caveat that I have uh, focused on regarding the repeatability or reproducibility or the efficacy of some measurements. But if all these methods will allow you to uh, do it, perform a checkup of the animal's condition, unfortunately, uh, they don't have much of a predictive value for the future, except maybe for the accelerometer developed uh, here by IFIP, which allows you to predict lameness 24 hours before, before it becomes apparent, but only for uh, cells with a uh, parity number of five. Now, blood biomarkers uh, show you uh, the level of uh, alteration in the bone and the uh, joint uh, cartilage, and they have been used for veterinary medicine, but not very often for pigs, and they don't seem to be very relevant in order to predict lameness. France has assessed the use of biomarkers in order to predict osteochondrosis in pigs by taking blood samples and bone samples when the animals were being slaughtered. Pigs with signs of osteochondrosis uh, had higher marker levels uh, regarding uh, cartilage synthesis, so CB2, and also cartilage degradation, but lower levels in the uh, C2C degradation marker. And uh, regarding bone, the uh, PYD marker was reduced when osteochondrosis was uh, present, but uh, bone synthesis uh, markers such as osteocalcin or BAP were not 
did not seem to be affected, which shows that uh, interpreting biomarkers as to use them as indicators for lameness uh, should, is, should be used cautiously because uh, depending on the publication, there may be contradictions depending on the uh, criteria being used. For instance, osteochondrosis and lameness or the type of animal, uh, fattening pig or sow and the stage of lameness, early stages or advanced stages. Stavrakakis showed that uh, CP2 and C2C went in different directions, opposite directions uh, to what was had been observed by France as the uh, animal uh, animal gait became stiffer and stiffer. But uh, Zawa and Wedekind showed that uh, COMP, CT, CTX2 moved in the same direction with the osteochondrosis and lameness scores. And Wedekind's study showed that osteocalcine decreased uh, when uh, lameness, uh, signs of lameness were observed in the sows. We need more work, more research to confirm the usefulness of biomarkers as uh, predictors for lameness uh, in order to uh, use uh, nutrition, uh, to assess nutrition efficacy. We're now going to look at the role played by nutrition on lameness. Energy concentration and nutritional concentration in feeds uh, allows for faster growth, but it also increases the risk of osteoporosis. Therefore, rationed feeding uh, for young reproducing uh, breeding animals could be a way to reduce uh, the risk of osteochondrosis, but it's sometimes difficult or costly to implement versus uh, distribution of a conventional feed for lactation or gestation. Macronutrients uh, can be calcium or phosphorus, which are absolutely essential for bone development. Or, and there are relative, uh, so the uh, relative intake should be taken into consideration. We can also talk about fiber content because it allows to help the animal um, reach the CIT and reduce uh, the risk of lameness and also the risk of uh, abnormal behavior. Trace elements play an essential role in the uh, development, normal development of tissue and also enzyme related processes. Zinc is absolutely essential for bone to develop and collagen as well. Collagen is essential to make sure that bones are solid and hard. Copper plays a role with lysid oxidase uh, in order to reinforce collagen by reticulating the collagen. Manganese allows to synthesize a proteoglycan gel in the cartilage and also develops the organic matrix for bone. Zinc and copper are also both involved in the uh, production and reticulation of keratin, and therefore they are good for the skin and the uh, hooves. Mineral reserves in the sows will be depleted progressively. In parity three sows, the losses may reach 15 to 20% versus animals uh, which are not gestating at the same age. Trace elements are now provided at very high levels, possibly in excess of the uh, recommendations. In spite of the high levels, the problems uh, remain probably due to the fact that the minerals being used are not highly available. And sometimes there may be an antagonism between them and the other nutrients in the feed. So the use of organic forms is a way to provide more bioavailable uh, minerals with less antagonism. Uh, for instance, uh, hydroxylide methionine chelates has helped reduce considerably in several species the uh, lameness uh, issues or the bone defects. And in the paper, you will find uh, a reference to this work. In sows, uh, this was a trial conducted in Spain in 80 farms, uh, so 120,000 sows. Organic sources of uh, zinc, copper, and manganese allowed to reduce the incidence uh, of uh, culling rates due to lameness. And among the organic minerals, Hydroxy analog methionine chelates increased significantly the percentage of sows which reached uh, parity three, and this obviously decreased the rate of culling. This is another trials from 2015. Trace elements are provided in the form of a mix of uh, 
organic, uh, inorganic uh, trace elements and HMTPBA chelates. And this allowed to decrease significantly the uh, number of uh, cullings, uh, especially when the culling was due to a lameness issue. Again, the same trial, subpopulation of gilts. Here we assessed the mobility scores between naught and 12. Naught is normal, 12 is serious lameness. And at the same time, we uh, checked plasmatic osteocal sign and the uh, CTX2 marker, which shows a uh, cartilage degradation by using a mix of HEPBMA uh, chelates and inorganic uh, trace elements, we were able to improve the mobility score and also to uh, improve the quantity of seocalcine found in the blood. However, this did not affect the cartilage degradation marker CTX2. Among the amino acids, methionine seems to be the most relevant because it provides sulfur. It helps bone to grow by helping uh, osteoblastic differentiation. And it also uh, provides cysteine, which plays a role in the keratinizing process. Now, this trial is from uh, 2018, and Faber showed that either taken alone or in combination with organic elements, methionine provided at 102% versus lysine improved significantly the lameness scores. However, it did not influence uh, hoof injuries, organic uh, trace elements uh, were more helpful to help solve uh, hoof injuries. One may not conclude without talking about vitamins, uh, especially A, C and D vitamins and the role they play on bone health and the uh, health of uh, good health of um, the animal's limbs and their bony structure. Biotin showed uh, that it improved the hoof condition and hoof health. However, we have a caveat because there seems sometimes that there is no effect on, there is not a specific injury to be shown. This may be due to the fact that it's very difficult to assess the injuries. And um, as I said earlier, sometimes the uh, Injury can be quite severe. So lameness are a problem, a significant problem for technical, economic and society related reasons. And although we have relatively well identified the cause of lameness, the ways to measure lameness um, are not sufficient. There is room for improvement. And beyond the uh, subjective methods, uh, visual, physical ones, there are biomarkers that we may think about using in the future. There might be promising ways to uh, diagnose and detect lameness. What about nutrition, feed restriction or energy uh, restriction in young breeding animals in order to slow down their growth might be a way to reduce, uh, to mitigate the problem, but they are difficult to implement. And we also have um, trace elements and especially bioavailable trace elements, organic or chelated trace elements, which might represent a uh, way to uh, use nutrition to uh, mitigate the impact of lameness and also improve breeding performances. Uh, and this obviously would benefit both the animal's welfare, but also the environment. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm obviously available for any questions you might want to put to me. Thank you, Mireille, for this presentation. We have 10 minutes for questions, not a minute more. Do not hesitate. Please uh, post your questions. Uh, we have the first few ones coming in. Maybe the first question. What about the biotin dose? What dose would you recommend? That's a good question. Unfortunately, I do, I do not have the answer. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't give you an answer. Not now. I have not really looked into uh, the uh, recommended doses for biotin and these nutrients in general. Okay, second question. Should we mix uh, the sources of uh, trace elements, uh, chelated, uh, mineral, organic? That's another good question. 
donc chez Novus, on est on est on a. Novus. We have been working on trace elements for years now, and initially we we gave the animals a mix of uh, inorganic and organic uh, trace elements, and in the very few in the very first trials, we gave them a mix, and we gave relatively uh, conventional levels uh, following the recommendations. But more recently, in the last few trials, especially the one that I showed uh, that was conducted in Spain. The uh, intake was reduced, and uh, we uh, gave only uh, inorganic so chelates of, of uh, hydroxy analog trace elements, and um, the uh, performances were equal to or even uh, better than uh, what we had achieved with the combinations in the past. And obviously, it improved also um, excretion issues. Another question, recommendations uh, for trace elements, organic trace elements. Does the recommendation apply throughout the uh, South Korea or could we maybe focus on lactation or gestation, a number of physiological stages in the animal's life? Well, we have been focusing on uh, young breeding animals. so what nutrients to give to young breeding animals, especially zinc. zinc. But regarding the uh, South Korea gestation lactation, we would recommend to use the same dose, gestation and lactation. There is still so much that we still have to test and discover. so much we have to test because because we can measure bioavailable trace elements is also useful to uh, find out more and this is going to help us fine-tune the recommendations in the future question on vitamins vitamin intake dietary vitamins is this a promising way to uh, solve uh, lameness issues well, again, I'm sorry, the company uh, I work for does not specialize in vitamins, so I do not want to uh, provide uh, an answer. And I recommend that you talk to uh, experts, people who know more about vitamins than I do. Okay, question on post-weaning uh, dietary chelates. Um, would it be a way to uh, solve the problems to invest more on that particular stage? Just to make sure we don't miss the, uh, the, the right window. Well, that's exactly what was shown. When we talked about the growth of future breeding animals by combining uh, a well-formulated uh, diet, uh, but also in, it's by restricting uh, in intake of some nutrients, uh, we were able to achieve some interesting results. The trials shown in the uh, review revealed that uh, by giving a very specific diet at that stage with organic uh, trace elements, we were in the position to improve performances. Question about age for trace element supplementation. I think we've already covered that. Anything else? Otherwise, we move on to the poster break. We have one minute still, maybe two. If there are no more questions. Okay, last chance. Then we uh, would like to thank Mireille for a beautiful presentation, and uh, we now have a break. We will resume at uh, 15.50, so 10 to 4. I 
recommend that you uh, visit the virtual poster exhibition. 10, 15 minutes will, might not be sufficient to read all the posters. As you will see, there are recordings uh, sometimes uh, added to the posters to provide additional information. You will also find that some posters Uh, very much in tune with what we have been discussing so far, mineral composition and how to modulate mineral composition, especially in sows. And there are many more posters uh, covering different topics, impact, uh, impact of uh, amino acid enzyme supplementation, uh, live yeast, etc. And you will find posters regarding uh, feeding behavior, drinking and eating behavior, value of nutrients and how raw materials can interact uh, with each other when they are mixed in the same diet. So, see you at 10 to 4 sharp to start the next session. Do not forget the posters will be available until the uh, February the 12th. So if you don't have time to read them all now during the break, you can go back later and read them later. Thank you very much. See you at 10 to 4. de reprendre la session euh, alimentation. Okay, okay, boys and girls. Let's get back to work. Now we're going to discuss another depletion repletion sequence. A talk by Marion Lutry from University Laval in Quebec. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to talk to you about the results of our trial regarding the effect of phosphorus and calcium depletion replenishment on performance and bone mineralization in growing pigs. There's a lot of interest around phosphorus these days for two main reasons. Number one, the resource is limited, and this leads to an increase in price and uh, a reduction in availability. So what about sustainability? And the other reason is this phosphorus excretion can lead to eutrophication, particularly in high production density areas. So this is an environmental aspect. Now, in order to resolve this problem, the question is, how can we uh, improve utilization of phosphorus? So we place ourselves from the point of view in nutrition, and we're testing a depletion repletion strategy with a goal of increasing the efficiency of phosphorus utilization in practical terms. How do we set up this type of sequence? Taking as an example, a three phase feeding uh, sequence to meet the calcium and phosphorus needs of the animal. So we are deliberately going to reduce the calcium or phosphate or calcium and phosphate uh, concentration during the first phase. So depletion, depletion followed by repletion. So why are we taking an interest in this strategy? Because in the course of recent trials, we found that a depletion, repletion strategy in pigs could lead to the same BMC in those pigs than in others. So we reduce the phosphorus uh, uh, intake and reduce the phosphorus output by improving utilization rate during both phases, depletion and repletion. However, in the second trial, we realized that the strategy does not work every time, in particular, when the deficiency uh, when the calcium deficiency is higher than the phosphorus deficiency. So the assumptions at the beginning of the trial were these. It is possible to reach the same level of bone mineralization using depletion repletion strategy versus a control group. Depletion makes it possible to improve efficiency of utilization of phosphorus and calcium. And also it might be possible to achieve the same level of bone mineralization in strategies that include or do not include phosphates. So to test these assumptions, we set up five different strategies, feeding strategies out of uh, 
over 240 uh, pigs in 40 different feedlots. So the control group received 100% of its uh, digestible phosphorus and calcium requirements through throughout growth uh, for maximum bone mineralization. The CNC group received the same feed as the control group in phases one and three and received a depleted diet in phase two, covering 60% of its uh, digestible phosphorus requirements and 65% of its calcium requirements to avoid too high a calcium deficiency compared with phosphorus. So we targeted a normal calcium over digestible phosphorus ratio. That's uh, 2.6. The CHC group received the same feed as the control group in phases one and three and received a depleted diet in phase two, covering 60% of its digestible phosphorus requirements and 80% of its calcium requirements. And this led to a high calcium over digestible phosphorus ratio, 3.2. The phytase group did not receive a phosphate regardless of the feeding phase. It did receive phytase without covering 100% of the necessary requirements for maximizing bone mineralization during phase one, which explains the 60% in phase one versus 100% in phases two and three. The last group received a diet covering 60% of its digestible phosphorus and calcium needs throughout the growth cycle. Now, uh, intake was estimated per phase, uh, per feedlot, uh, uh, individual weighings at the beginning and at the end of each phase. And uh, because of the transfer to the slaughterhouse at the end of the trial was staggered, we used the second to last weighing because there were more pigs than at the last weighing, because at the last weighing, a lot of pigs had already been transferred to the slaughterhouse. We also performed scans at the beginning and end of each phase. So on eight pigs per treatment. So this gave us the body uh, composition. We uh, performed total but separate collections of feces and urine out of six pigs per treatment during phase one for the control phytase and uh, uh, low groups. And in phase two on the control group CNC and CHC groups. We analyzed the uh, results per feedlot except for the scans for which we performed individual analyses. And during phase one, we performed a variance analysis using two keys of multiple comparisons. And for phases two and three, we worked on contrast. So control group versus phytase group to look at the impact of phytase and repletion. Uh, control group versus the depleted groups to look at the impact of depletion. During phase two, we uh, we pitted the low group versus the depleted groups to look at the level of calcium in the feed. And in phase three, we compare the control group with the uh, low group to look at the effect of depletion. So in phase one, there were three different groups, the control group, the low group, and the phytase group. And the last group received the same level of calcium digestible phosphorus. Regarding performance, or rather growth performance, no difference was shown between the three groups in terms of live weight and ADG. However, a live weight and ADG of the phytase group was lower than in the control group. This gives us a difference in live weight of 3% and a difference uh, in a and a difference in average gain of, uh, of 5%. But the initial urine results showed that the level of phosphorus is not detectable in the phytase group, whereas there's more calcium, much more than in the other groups. Now, bone mineral content and bone mineral content gain are the same for the phytase in low groups and lower than in the control group. This indicates two different things. Number one, the phytase worked. Be because we have the same BMC in the two groups and also that uh, the depletion has succeeded. So we have a calcium retention coefficient that is higher in the phytase group, slightly lower in the low group, and lowest in the control group. The uh, digestible phosphorus retention coefficient is equivalent between the phytase and low group, but lower in the control group. Phase two two more treatments. We also depleted the CNC and CHC groups. No difference between the two groups was shown in terms of growth performance. The BMC is the same between the control group, the phytase group, and the two depleted the group CNC and CHC. What does this show? This shows that the phytase group was able to offset its bone mineralization deficiency. It also shows that the depletion did not work on the CNC and CHC group because they have the same BMC level as the control group. 
And we wonder where this is coming from. Is it because the calcium was a limiting factor in all of the groups that went through the metabolic cage, that is the control group and the two depleted groups? Because in the initial urine analysis results, we find that the calcium is below the detection level. But we do see the phosphorus. Now, logically, we find that the D's group has a BMC gain that is higher than the control group, but the coverage level for digestible uh, calcium, digestible phosphorus is the same. We also find that the BMC is the same between the low group and the control group. These two results indicate that there may be an increase in the utilization of phosphorus and calcium. This may be due to a so-called uh, memory effect of depletion. So what do we see? With the retention coefficients for calcium and phosphorus, so we're seeing a 70% uh, difference uh, in the phytase group relative to the control group. And also this coefficient seems to be a higher in the phytase group than in the control group. What else do we find? The uh, retention coefficient for calcium is higher in the group than in the depleted group. And regarding a phosphorus, it is higher in the depleted groups than in the control group. Phase three, we have always considered that there were five treatments, even though the depleted groups do receive the uh, control diet because we want to take into account the animal's history. No difference between the groups has been shown, whether in terms of live weight or in terms uh, of uh, average daily gain, FCR or intake. Now, the uh, BMC and BMC again were the same for the uh, control group, phytase, and the two depleted groups. However, uh, the BMC for the low group is lower by 16%, and the gain is lower by 51%. So the depletion effect that we saw during phase two is no longer seen at all in phase three. No difference has been shown between the groups in terms of the calcium and phosphorus uh, bone uh, retention impact. So all of the pigs have the same BMC. At the end of phase one, we find that depletion worked well for the phytase and low group. In green, the phytase group managed to offset its mineralization deficiency. The differential between the low group, the control group, and it's the same at the end of phase two as at the end of phase one, but depletion did not work on the CHC and C and C group. Uh, lastly, at the end of phase three, we find that the low group is much lower than the control group, and we're seeing another rather interesting phenomenon. It seems that the BMC of the C and C and CHC group is slightly higher than for the control group because the live weight is higher. By way of conclusion, there's no difference in terms of BMC between the control phytase and depleted groups at the end of the uh, growing phase. Clearly, depletion led to an improvement in uh, efficiency of utilization of the phosphorus and calcium. So this reduced the phosphorus uh, output. It might be possible to uh, feed uh, the pigs without phosphates because we were able to achieve the same level of BMC without altering growth performance. Lastly, blood work will help us better understand a number of underlying phenomena. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Question number one. During the first phase, excellent retention of phosphorus has been observed. Do you know why? Do you have an explanation for that? Can you all hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Well, oh, excellent, you can hear me. Well, clearly depletion does have an effect on those groups that received little phosphates. So what happens is that a regulation mechanism comes into place rather early on. Sound quality problems. Could you maybe turn off the camera because it's consuming too much bandwidth? That way the audio will get better. Thank you. Sound quality. We have a problem with the sound quality. 
there's a reduction in excretion via urine. And if we calculate this leads to, to better efficiency in terms of phosphorus retention. Okay. Another question, can we expect the same results when dealing with animals that uh, whether they are fed ad lib or whether they are rationed? Good question. Thank you for asking. Well, our animals were fed ad lib, no rationing whatsoever. Would the answer be the same? Would they respond in the same way? I think so. Uh, I think so, yeah. As long as uh, there is a calcium and a phosphorus depletion, the regulation mechanism will come into play and the animal will respond. So I do think we'll get the same response. We have another question regarding regulation of intake, depending on the level of deficiency. Well, we do not observe that. But these observe. This is widely discussed in literature and some studies you see a reduction in intake when there's a phosphorus deficiency, but we didn't see this. And we didn't see this in recent studies either. Either the level goes down, but it's not low enough, or but there was no impact on intake. What about blood work? What about blood parameters? Did you, did you analyze them? For example, the uh, concentration of calcium, the concentration of calcium and phosphorus in the blood. Did you look at that? Yes, that's the plan. Calcium, phosphorus, magnesium also, concentrations in the blood because we realized that magnesium is a good indicator. It indicates, well, uh, it, it it's a good indicator of bone mineralization and also the calcium to phosphorus ratios. Those ratios explain a lot of things. Also, we look at vitamin D, parathormone as well. We'll try looking at that and other bone markers, uh, markers for bone resorption and aggression. Oh, do you have preliminary explanations uh, to explain the increased efficiency in phosphorus and calcium deposition? I know you're working on it, but do you have any uh, initial assumptions to share with us? Well, at the time of depletion, obviously we're in the midst of regulation. So it makes sense that uh, calcium and phosphorus retention efficiency is increased, but in in terms of repletion, um, there's no regulation involved. But there may there seems to be a memory effect, which I can't explain yet. Some sort of memory effect, and as a result, the animal is capable of maintaining that and maybe overcoming this uh, potential for mineral deposition in the bones and to catch up with the control group to some extent. Okay, you'll have to come back next year to explain this, to explain what's actually going on. Thank you so much, Marion. Now we're going to hear the next presentation, a talk by Natalie Kinyu on the influence of rationing and coverage amino acid requirements on the performance of growing pigs according to weather conditions. The influence of rationing and coverage of amino acid requirements on the performance of growing pigs according to weather conditions. This topic was explored by Natalie Quigno, David Renaudot, and Gérard Domas as part of a collaboration between IFEP, the Swan Institute, and INRA A. By way of introduction, I will rely on this graph which shows changes in the use of energy by pigs fed ad lib. Now the energy is deposited in the form of lipids or proteins and this contributes to growth and this determines the composition of the weight gain. These two factors themselves determine the weight and fatness in the carcass at slaughter. Today we'll take a particular interest in, the, in fatness. The fat content in the carcass, this criterion, is uh, measured using the lean meat percentage, which has a relatively high prediction error. So a project was uh, set up to develop a, a method for characterization and precision using an RX scanner. So we made this trial, and the goal was to modify the animal's body fat 
to feed the scanner uh, various carcasses and cuts with different compositions. For this, we toyed with three different factors. First of all, rationing. Generally, rationing is used to reduce fat deposition and increase the lean fraction of the carcass. Amino acid intake, we know that if amino acids requirements are not met, this slows down protein deposition and increases the fat content of carcasses. And lastly, climate control. A recent study results show that heat stress uh, increases the uh, fat content in the weight gain. Weight gain. Now I'm going to introduce to you the growth performance results that we achieved. I'm going to show you the, the main aspects of this experimental design. We compared AL pigs, so pigs fed ad libitum, uh, and RA pigs who were rationed. And the goal was to reduce intake by 20% for the rationed pigs. In parallel, we designed two three-phase feeding sequences. So the digestible lysine intake per megajoule of net energy was selected based on changes in the requirements of female populations in pink uh, or bearers in blue. So the pigs are crossbreds from Pietran boars and crossbred large white land race sows. This led to three feed management options. So on the one hand, the ALA and ALB groups who were fed ad libitum using the ARB sequence, so designed to undercover to undercover the requirements. On the other hand, the RAA group of ration pigs using the A sequence. So three feeding strategies, three times two sexes equals six pans of six pigs per experimental block. So Rearing conditions during both production cycles. The first cycle was in the winter and early spring of 2019. The second cycle was in the summer and early fall of the same year. On average, throughout the fattening period for both production cycles, outdoor temperature was 10 degrees higher for the summer cycle than for the winter cycle. Now, during fattening, we measured the weekly feed intake per pen. We weighed the pigs individually every two weeks. And this uh, enabled us to set up the rationing plan for the pen based on weight for the rationed or AA group. So slaughtering was staggered to the tune of six transfers per production cycle due to scanning constraints, no more than 40 half carcasses per week. We also scanned BFT and BMT using the image meter. Thanks to the data, we calculated the feed intake per pig, either on a cumulative basis from the start of the fattening period or calculating the DFI, the daily feed intakes. We also calculated growth speed, FCR, and the lean meat percentage. So two different peers, either until slaughter or until we achieved a final weight that was comparable. We performed statistical analysis using SAS software. We used the pen as the experimental unit and the variance analysis looked at the following principal effects. Uh, the production cycle, an effect merged with the thermal conditions, feed management, sex, and interactions. This graph shows changes in weekly intake for both cycles, whether they are fed ad lib, AL, or rationed, or A, using the A feeding sequence. So between the two continuous lines, green and gray, we see a large differential from the end of the first two weeks. And this reflects the impact of the rearing conditions. Now, if we look at the cumulative intake for the first 89 days of the fattening period, the intake differential between AL and RA pigs is 18% for the first cycle. And we see a similar differential for the second cycle. And we also see a 20% difference between the two ad lib groups. So when we factor in the effects of the rearing conditions and the rationing, this is reflected in a 34% difference between the ad lib pigs of the first cycle and the rationed pigs of the second cycle. Now, bearing in mind the, the intake levels and rearing conditions, we find that pigs from cycle two have a lower slaughter weight than cycle one pigs, regardless of the feeding sequence A or B. As for the lean meat percentage, we achieved our target which was to have groups of animals with contrasting body compositions. We find that the lean meat percentage is improved by rationing, but it deteriorates, well, whether significantly or tendentially, when the amino acid deficiency gets worse. Now, let's look at the other performance criteria, so growth speed and feed conversion rate. 
so FCR to the right, depending on the feeding level. So the results for the AL pigs, ad lib pigs, are shown by the large blue dot. The small blue dot represents the RA, the rationed pigs. So the dots are connected by a green line for cycle one and by a gray line for cycle two. The continuous line reflects a significant performance differential and the dot line a less significant difference. Observation number one, when the drop in intake is similar due to heat or due to rationing, the drop in ADG is also similar. However, the FCR of rationed pigs seem to increase relative to the ad lib pigs in both cycles. And this is ascribed to the fact that even though the Russian pigs have lower body fat, they probably expand more energy for physical activity uh, from having to compete at the trough. Secondly, the 38% drop in intake due to the combined effect of heat and rationing triggers a very significant drop in AGG average daily gain. So at the end of the day, the growth component relative to the maintenance component in total energy expenditure leads to a major drop in FCR when compared with ad lib pigs from the same cycle or rationed pigs from the previous cycle. Now let's look at performance based on amino acid intake. The blue dots represent the results for the A feeding sequence and the red dots for the B sequence. On both graphs, you see that the red dots are located slightly to the right of the blue dots, which reflects a slightly higher intake without this being significant. Meanwhile, the impact on growth speed of the reduced amino acid intake is relatively limited. However, we find a surge in FCR as soon as the diet contains less amino acids. As it happens, interaction between feed management on the one hand and pig sex on the other is highly significant. So on the graphs, you have the results depending on sex type. So pink for females and light blue for barrows, castrated males. And what do you see? Under the B feeding sequence, FCR deteriorates much more in females than in barrows, which means that their deficiencies are much worse than the barrows. By way of conclusion, this uh, study confirms that it is interesting to take sex into account. Uh, sex is a factor uh, when using AA supplementation rationally for growing pigs. Also, rationing and the coverage of AA requirements can be used to improve the lean meat percentage. Uh, by way of conclusion, this study makes it possible to update and confirm the fact that rationing is interesting and helps cover amino acid requirements. However, the impact on FCR is not systematic. So to discriminate between feed management options and their impacts on carcass characteristics, we need to rely on other growth performance criteria, some of which have yet to be developed. The results are consistent with higher fatness in the weight gain when temperatures are high, and we need confirmation from more accurate carcass composition measurements. This Canali project received funding from the Ministry for Agriculture and Food uh, out of the CASDAR funds managed by France Agrimaire. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you for this presentation, Natalie. We have time for a couple of questions. Ludovic, go ahead. We have a first question for Natalie. Uh, as temperature increase, the, uh, the feed is less attractive. So how do we explain the increased fatness? Um, the metabolism of the pig adapts. And I, and I think my friend here is better placed, is better positioned to answer this because he co-authored the, uh, the article. I think, oh, you want me to answer? Yeah, why don't you? You're right here, so I'm going to use you. Okay, so yeah. Yes, the, the body adapts. 
and this reduces the protein deposition. So you find yourself in a situation where excess energy is deposited in the form of lipids. So this means higher fatness in the carcass when temperatures are high. Another question, do you think that all rationing levels have an impact on FCR in the same way? Nope. No, I don't think so. The first rationing level, well, if it's not too intense in practice, it, it leads to a little bit of waste in the pen. Now, if rationing is too high or too intense, this will increase FCR in a much more pronounced way. But these results, while well, chemists are suppressed, you mean to tell you the truth. So this is the impression it gives me. In terms of animal response to uh, climate conditions, that are animals that may be more sensitive to rearing conditions, particularly in terms of feed. They are more sensitive than they used to be, and there can be interference. And we need to characterize this interference at the pen level, and this can cause losses. We suspect losses will differ depending on activity because that activity consumes a lot of energy. This is how we explain the, uh, the observations. We have a couple of questions that are related to this. Uh, can we expect similar results in females and in intact boars in case of an amino acid deficit? Another question regarding sexing. Can it have a, an impact on animal response to deficiencies? There's a connection between the two. Um, yes. If the intake is not enough to meet the animal's requirements, by definition, this will uh, influence FCR. Intact males have even higher needs than females. So we can suspect that they would have responded too, particularly even more so than the females, because they respond to uh, interactions between animals as long when feed is rationed. And sexing, well, there's a risk there, I think. We don't really know who ate what in the pen, well, between the females and the barrows. Maybe some will eat more than their share, and the females will find themselves in an even worse situation because the guys are hogging all the food. Now, the economic compromise or trade-off between the positive effect on a lean meat percentage, on, on the lean meat percentage and on FCR. So what's the trade-off? Uh, I guess it all depends on the price of feed and the price of the LMP. But we have economic experts here who might disagree. They might say that it's more complicated than that, but that would be my simple answer. Let's put things back into perspective based on the economic circumstances. We have another question in the Q&A section. Is there a correlation between increased FCR and fatness? Increase in the studies? No, because uh, in one case, uh, FCR uh, changes as uh, uh, LMP uh, changes as well, but sometimes it doesn't. FCR remains stable even though LMP changes. That's the first time I've seen this. The two are uncoupled. That's the first time I've seen this, which uh, opens up prospects. We need to go further. Maybe there are other criteria for efficiency. Growth performance is an opportunity to correct course, usually in the index that we used to refer to to audit slaughterhouse uh, our results uh, doesn't systematically work. Thank you. Perfect. We have a couple more questions, but feel free to answer them directly in the chat box. Many thanks, uh, Natalie. Let's now hear the second, uh, the next presentation, uh, a talk by Pauline Grimm. And uh, this is a review on the replacement of cereals by sugar beet pulp, a driver to improve behavior and digestive health in pig farming. Good 
Bonjour à tous. Je travaille Hello, chez Lacto. Hello, everybody. I work for Lacto, field the company specializing in the uh, gut physiology for animals in the study of uh, gastrointestinal health. We focus on the uh, connection between uh, feeding, uh, performance, health, and behavior. And we look at the role played by fibers in feeding. For this Congress, we perform the synthesis on the uh, substitution, uh, replacing uh, grain with uh, sugar beet pulp and the impact that this has to on the digestive health, uh, health of swine. Since the year 2000, adding fiber to pig diet uh, has been increasing, as shown in this article, in this uh, paper where we see the number of uh, papers. Uh, Several beneficial effects have been described, uh, imp improved uh, gut health uh, and welfare for gestating sows, but these benefits are not necessarily reported, as was shown in a recent uh, study, and we have uh, contradictory observations, uh, which may be due to the difference in fiber sources used in the trials and the type of fibers. The different uh, swine feed uh, contain a variable quantity of fiber, sometimes uh, greater in some. The type of fiber can also vary with different contents in lining, cellulose, and other non-cellulosic polysaccharides. Uh, non-cellulosic polysaccharides can be divided uh, in uh, solubles uh, or insolubles uh, with pectins. Uh. We noticed that beet pulp uh, has a very high content in soluble fibers, and that's the reason why we focused uh, on uh, beet pulp, uh, because this large quantity of soluble fiber gives its properties, which are very specific. Uh, they're highly fermentable. Water retention is also high, and therefore the swelling capacity, which may have an impact on the digested uh, matter and have an impact on health, performance, and behavior. We performed a bibliography review selecting the scientific international papers peer reviewed on uh, the substitution, partial substitution of grains with the uh, SBP. And we looked at the impact this has on uh, digestive health and behavior at all stages in the uh, breeding. 37 articles, uh, papers were chosen and studied. You will find them all in the proceedings, but today I would like to focus on the effect shown on digestive health and more specifically the results regarding gut health for, for her gut and hindgut. We are going to look at the uh, effects reported uh, on the foregut. The microbiota, microbial activity and uh, immunity and mucosal integrity were studied for this uh, purpose. Regarding the microbiota, no difference uh, in the bacterial uh, jejunum and ileum bacterial uh, population was observed in piglet fed with an 8% diet or 12% diet uh, for uh, growing pigs. However, a recent study showed that uh, when the pigs were submitted to a post-weaning uh, E-Tech uh, heterogenic uh, challenge, piglets re receiving a 10% bulk diet showed a decrease in the binding of Escherichia coli versus the conventional uh, diet. This could be explained uh, by the fact that there is an indirect uh, effect uh, the pulp increasing the uh, beneficial bacteria to the expense of pathogen pathogens or a uh, direct uh, action of fibers, which um, decrease um, Escherichia coli binding. Therefore, feeding beet pulp could provide a better protection against pathogens. Regarding microbial activity, again in the foregut, two studies measured uh, fermentation products. And uh, in the uh, pig ileum, when the animals were fed with a reference diet containing 8% of beet pulp uh, and similar concentrations were observed. Finally, regarding immunity and mucosal integrity in the foregut, uh, in the piglet uh, ileum, when they received 2.55% beet pulp uh, or uh, growing pigs with a 23% beet pulp diet, no uh, difference was shown in the villi and the intestinal crypts. So the second study showed that the jejunal wall tended to be thicker in the pigs that received a beet uh, rich diet. And the caliciform cells, which uh, produce mucus, uh, had a greater sense, uh, density in the jejunum. This may uh, advocate in favor of reinforced uh, gut barrier in animals receiving but, uh, beet pulp. And during the ETEC challenge post weaning, the animals consuming a 10% uh, diet uh, had a greater claudine one messenger RNA expression, which uh, suggests better maintenance, metrical preservation of the intestinal integrity. And they also looked at the presence of interleukin 10 
messenger RNA, which were reduced, and this is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, which means that we have a regulation of the inflammatory response in animals receiving PARP during an ETEC challenge. Now, according to the authors, the impact on the gut barrier could uh, be connected to volatile fatty acids in uh, beet-fed pigs, but as we said earlier, no difference could be shown so far. The me protective mechanisms are still to be understood. Now, we would like to talk about uh, the uh, impact this has on the foregut, and this is where we have uh, found more trials, more papers. For the microbiota, two studies showed uh, bacterial diversity in animals receiving 8% uh, beet uh, pulp or a conventional diet. A number of bacterial uh, species was found to be increased in the beet-rich uh, diet, especially 13 days after weaning. The result uh, speaks in favor of uh, a richer bacterial diversity in beet-fed pigs, which may link to uh, a uh, higher substrate variety and could have a favorable impact on gut health because a greater bacterial diversity is associated with more resilience in the animals faced with the stress, but that is still to be confirmed. Other trials have compared the uh, microbiota uh, composition in animals receiving a beach diet in variable quantities, both weaning or during uh, finishing, uh, and culture techniques were used. Lactic bacteria were studied, or uh, lactobacilli, enterococci, or bifidobacteria. And half the study showed an increase in the lactic bacteria concentration in the hindgut of pigs receiving pulp. Beet pulp. Interestingly, a study showed a linear increase in the lactobacilli concentration in response to a progressive increase in the uh, pulp proportion, 3 to 12 percent, in the piglets uh, after two and five weeks following weaning. Higher bacteri lactic bacteria concentration suggests that beet pulp could be favorable for gut health, especially considering that bacterial species belonging to this group uh, have. Uh, good properties that reinforce immunity or provide better control over pathogen bacteria. However, in the seven days following the uh, post-weaning ETEC challenge, no uh, excretion, uh, Ishira coli excretion uh, score difference was uh, observed. And when they looked at Ishira coli, coli forms an enterobacteria, bacteria groups that uh, are pathogen, there was no effect being shown here. Only one study showed the reduction in the number of enterobacteria in beet fed pigs. This might be due to a higher proportion of inclusion and adding pulp to the diet could provide a better control over pathogen bacteria. Surprisingly, only two trials, as far as we know, looked in at uh, fibrolytic bacteria in the swine uh, Heimgut. Fingerprinting showed that uh, Ruminococcus species bacteria were found only in piglets fed with 8% beet. Therefore, we can think that there is a higher fibrolytic bacteria content if we add pulp. But another study that looked at Ruminococcus flavifacients showed no difference in the bacteria, cellular lytic bacteria concentration. We need more trials to understand the effect of more beet pulp regarding fibrolytic bacterial content in the hindgut. Regarding uh, bacterial activity in the hindgut, many trials were conducted at different stages of breeding with different uh, pulp proportions. Total, uh, higher total volatile fatty acid concentrations are observed, and this is in agreement with the fact that uh, soluble fibers are more fermentable. The animal therefore has a greater uh, energy intake, and another trial looked at uh, protein fermentation and some uh, possibly toxic derivatives that may damage the uh, mucosa and generate inflammation. Protein-derived uh, fermentation metabolites were shown in the uh, animals that have 12% uh, beet pulp. So uh, easily fermentable pulp in the uh, hindgut could be a strategy to limit uh, gut inflammation. Regarding the uh, colon mucosa, no visual difference was observed uh, if, as far as lesions were concerned uh, under the microscope. However, a smaller number of lymph nodes were measured in piglets fed with an 8% beet diet, and a higher number of lymph lymphocytes by square millimeter was observed in the pigs that were fed with a 23% beet uh, rich diet. This could be explained by a larger bacterial diversity and therefore a larger number of uh, bacterial antigen, including beet pulp in the diet, could 
contribute to better immunity and mucosal health. In conclusion, analyzing these uh, results uh, seem to indicate that adding beet pulp uh, to replace grain in the swine diet is in favor of better gut health and environment at all stages in the animal's life. In the uh, full gut, it reinforces the uh, gut uh, barrier and its integrity. And in the hind gut, it seems to be in favor of larger bacterial diversity and more stable microbiota and greater bacterial activity. Other trials will confirm the initial observations, but also will bring additional information so that we will be able to find the optimal quantity of beet pulp that to be added to the diet to have uh, benefits uh, regarding gut health and behavior at all stages in the animal's life without uh, damaging uh, zootechnical performance. It also might be interesting to look into the optimum balance between soluble and insoluble fibers in order to achieve the best possible results for breeding. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, do not hesitate to contact us if you want to find out more. Thank you, Pauline, for this uh, very interesting uh, synthesis. Ludovic, do we have any questions? We've got three or four questions. Using uh, beet pulp, is it economically relevant because the prices have increased and so it's less available for breeders? Well, I, uh, I knew somebody was going to ask the question, so I started uh, looking uh, at pulp last year, a year and a half ago, and uh, at the time uh, the price was not so much of an issue, but as I uh, progressed in my work, I understood that the question would be raised. So yes, there will be a uh, financial uh, issue here when we are going to replace uh, grain with beet pulp. But on the other hand, there is obviously a benefit that needs to be taken in consideration. And we have to think about inclusion so to find the best diet uh, where it would be financially relevant, but still would provide some benefits for the animal. Another question, more or less on the same topic. In this trial, the fiber content varied and the beet pulp was replacing which raw material? Well, it did not necessarily replace a single raw material, sometimes more than one. In my inclusion criteria for the papers, I chose all those where the beet pulp was replacing a, a type of grain, either wheat or barley, maybe maize. I did not calculate the total fiber content in the diet. So when we say that we replace only part of the uh, the, the wheat uh, with a uh, fiber rich diet, but in the global study, I did not look into the uh, calculation. There is another question with equivalent doses. How can we explain the variability from one trial to another by uh, the variability in the fiber content? Well, exactly. I mean, that's what I said at the end of my presentation. We would need to understand the, 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 the role played by soluble and insoluble fibers in order to understand exactly what role will be played by incorporating more fibers into the diet. Another question, can we use, uh, can we call beet pulp a prebiotic nutrient? We discussed it and we are going to uh, organize a discussion on uh, equine feed. And uh, we were wondering whether bee pulp could be called a prebiotic nutrient for horses. In terms of classification, I guess it's not fairly accurate, but as far as the effects are concerned, yes, we may extrapolate and say that pulp has plays the role of a prebiotic nutrient, has a prebiotic function, soluble fibers that allow to feed part of the microbiota and reinforce, strengthen the microbiota, and therefore it could be considered as a prebiotic raw material. Thank you. When we see some of the papers you uh, showed, 3 to 12 percent uh, 
help in the uh, post-weaning diets uh, in animals uh, whose uh, ingestion level is uh, limiting uh, their capacity to uh, grow? Is this a limiting factor? Well, not necessarily. I did not go into the zootechnical part regarding feed ingestion, but in my synthetic work, I looked into it and I tried to understand whether there was a limit to what the animals were capable of ingesting and digesting and whether this limited their zootechnical performances and up to 10% it's okay. Until 10%, no problems. Above 10% depends on the trials, on the papers that I would recommend not to go over 10% based on what I have read in the literature for piglets. There did not seem to be a decrease in the technical performances. Okay, Ludovic, unless there is a burning question, a very short one that will elicit a very short answer. Would it be uh, relevant to use uh, beet pulp before weaning just to m preserve digestive health? Well, I have uh, wondered whether we might uh, feed the, the sows beet pulp. Um, in the previous presentation, we heard that they actually fed nutrients to the mothers to see the effects on the piglets. And well, we, we would look to need to look into that uh, to see whether the microbiota would be transferred to the uh, piglets. But I have. I don't know, I have not found a, a paper that uh, focuses on feeding beet pulp to the uh, sows to see the effect that this might have on the piglets. Uh, and if there are any more questions, uh, Pauline, you can uh, answer them in the Q&A function. Next presentation will be delivered by Elisabeth Chassé from the University of Laval in Quebec regarding the impact of adding enzymes on ileal digestibility of carbohydrates according to the size and frequency of meals. Hello, um, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce today my research project regarding the impact of adding enzymes on allele digestibility of carbohydrates according to the size and frequency of meals in growing pigs. I, my name is Elisabeth Chassé. I'm a student uh, at the Laval University, and this is where, where the in vivo trial took place. And the in vitro part was actually conducted uh, at the Horus University in ben Denmark. First of all, why would do we want to look in, into the uh, frequency and size of meals? In breeding farms, the animals are mostly fed at lib and do not really have a set number of meals. The hopper is there and the animals will simply go there when they're hungry. But during a nutritional trial, we have to limit the uh, quantity of uh, feed to twice a day, and so the feed uh, is not distributed the same way in both scenarios. In the literature, we find that, that the size and the number of meals may have an impact on digestibility of the nutrients, absorption, and metabolic availability of the nutrients. We can add exogenous enzymes to the feed to limit the anti-nutritional impact of fibers and phytate. On the left-hand side, we have a rabinoxylane molecule, and by adding silanase, we can clive it in smaller polysaccharides. The same here, by adding phytase, we can uh, cut uh, phosphate groups and release phosphorus, calcium, and proteins, which uh, might have been bound. And this really diminishes uh, environmental uh, excretion. And we can improve digestibility of energy by uh, degrading the fibers and creating a prebiotic effect. The smallest polysaccharide will be uh, fermented by the uh, gut microbiota, which will have a benefit, will be a benefit for gut health. However, there may be different variable effects due to pH, uh, for instance, uh, in vitro digestion. This is an interesting model because it allows to assess efficacy of enzymes on very specific substrate. We don't need animals. It's a very limited cost and it's a quick process uh, showing how the enzymes are going to have an effect. Now, here we wanted to look at the impact of the size and frequency of meals, as well as uh, enzyme supplementation, xylanase and phytases in a fiber rich uh, diet based on uh, wheat, comparing the results obtained in vivo to those we had obtained in vitro. So uh, method, uh, first of all, a nutritional trial in vitro, six sequestrated male Pigs, um, uh, upon arrival, they weighed 25 kilos, experimental uh, housing, 
six by six, six big, six period, six uh, treatments. And here we explain uh, how the it went. The animals were weighed on the first day and then to uh, calculate how much food they were going to consume. In days 13 and 14, we collected digest and feces. Experimental treatment. First, we had uh, the control group of what we normally do, two meals a day, two R, and then we had two more treatments, eight meals per day, and uh, eight R plus. Uh, eight R and eight R plus were animals. Uh, the animals, sorry, two R and eight R, the animals received three times the uh, metabolism by energy need, and uh, eight R plus, they received five times the uh, metabolism energy need as if they were fed ad lib. And in all three treatments, they were given feed without xylenase and phytase uh, supplementation. Here we have uh, our e, our 8RE and 8RE plus, same uh, feeding patterns, uh, except that in this case, uh, xylenase and phytase was added. Without going into too many details regarding the experimental uh, diet, uh, with or without enzymes, uh, wheat, uh, barley, uh, soya bean meal, and some uh, wheat bran, and we uh, used insoluble uh, ashes as a marker. And uh, here we have the nutrient composition, isoproteic and isoenergetic composition, xylenase activity and phytase activity or close to nil in the uh, enzyme-less uh, ration. And in the uh, ration with enzymes, we had uh, xylenase activity, BXU 2000 per kilo and 19 1,700 uh, respectively. In vitro experimentation, we only used xylenase. We did not look at the phytase effect. So we had the xyl-less treatment and the uh, xyl formula diet, uh, the diet with xylenase added when the uh, feed was uh, made uh, in the factory and the xyl added uh, diet was the diet where the xylenase was added in vitro, but not in the factory directly in the industrial feed. Activity in both uh, in the last two treatments was the same as the one found in the, uh, in the diet, 19,700 BXU. Without going into too many details, you can find this in the proceedings for digestive, for in vitro digestion, we had a gastric digestion, 90 minutes, pH 3.5 with the big pepsin. Then we had a foregut digestion, four hours, pH 6.8, porcine pancreatin. And finally, at the end, we deactivated the enzymes with an 80 degrees Celsius bath. And then we filtrated the samples to get the soluble fraction filtrate and the insoluble fracture, the indigestible residue. And we could assess hydrocarbon, soluble NSPs and, and direct NSPs. And in the insoluble part, we had the dry matter degradability and insoluble NSPs. Now we have the results. In the graph, in blue, we have the 2R treatment, pink 8R, and uh, orange, the 8R plus. And the uh, hatched bars are the uh, ones with the uh, enzyme. Now we look at the in vivo uh, results and we find increased digestibility of dry matter by adding enzymes, which uh, can be accounted for by the fact that uh, nutrients are released, uh, which were encapsulated by the fibers or the phytate. And more precisely here, insoluble NSPs digestibility, digestibility increases when adding enzymes. And Arabinoxylane, which is the xylenase direct substrate, is also more digestible due to fiber degradation. And for organic matter, we had a trend towards a, an increased digestibility by adding enzymes. Starch, we see a meal effect, two meals a day versus eight meals a day, better digestibility with two meals a day, but still a significant effect, although it's relatively limited, 0.3% and a trend towards a better digestibility with eight meals a day versus eight meals plus. Again, very limited. Now, I would like to show you the uh, in vivo allele fiber concentration, left-hand side total carbohydrate, hydrocarbons, and uh, on the right, uh, 
axons, arabinoxylo oligosaccharides. These are soluble molecules released by arabinoxylin with the presence of xylanase, and they have a prebiotic effect. The content is increased by adding enzymes, which speaks in favor of fiber solubilization when those fibers are insoluble and axons are released. For total hydrocarbons, we see that they are increased in the soluble formulation by adding enzyme. Fiber degradation. We, we find that insoluble fibers are become solubilized, uh, which means that we have uh, material which is uh, quickly fermented uh, for the microbiota, and we increase the energy balance uh, by uh, uh, releasing volatile fatty acids. In increasing the access content can be, uh, can be a benefit for the prebiotic effect, mainly due to the, the fact that butyrate is released, which is good for gut health. In vitro results, in yellow, we have the treatment without xylanase, in pink, added xylanase in the in vitro system, and in blue, when xylanase was added directly in the factory, in the diet, in the feed. No effect in no digestibility effect on uh, dry material, dry matter by adding xylanase. However, we see an increase in fiber degradation and more pronounced uh, when the uh, enzyme is directly added in vitro and not in the factory. Again, here we have the fiber ileo concentration with axos. We find uh, an increased con axos concentration for the exil formula treatment. Uh, with total hydrocarbons, we find an increased content in the soluble form, which means that fibers, uh, insoluble fibers become solubilized as was observed in vivo. Therefore, the in vitro results uh, match the in vivo results. They go in the same direction, and they confirm that what we had observed in vivo is due to the addition of enzymes and not something else, which confirms what we have observed in the pig experiment. Increasing NSP liberation release in the soluble form is more marked in the in vitro experiment, plus 45%, whereas digestibility increased, which was observed in vivo, plus 18%, which this might be due to the fact that in vitro, the conditions are better controlled, pH and retention time, the pH is stable, in vivo, the pH might vary, and the retention time the same. We have not observed uh, any effect uh, in the in vivo experience versus in vitro for dry matter digestibility, meaning that the in vitro model predicts the uh, overall feed digestibility, especially regarding fibers and the fiber related effect. In conclusion, enzyme supplementation can improve digestibility of a fiber rich feed. Size and frequency of meals seems to have a limited impact on digestibility, and the in vitro model is uh, useful to predict in vivo digestibility for the fibers in the alien. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will happily answer any question. Thank you, Elizabeth. There is a question. Can we expect uh, a similar effect uh, in growing and finishing pigs? You might, is there, you, you're talking about the enzyme effect? Well, yes, I guess the uh, effect would be similar with a uh, fiber-rich diet. If digestibility is improved, we might find the same thing uh, for finishing pigs. And maybe uh, we want to uh, assign values for energy uh, in the formulation. Have you thought about uh, additional uh, studies? Uh, there is another project that we was conducted uh, subsequently, and we looked at the enzyme effect, but we might think about adding, uh, increasing the, uh, the diet, the, 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 the duration, and maybe try to give the animals a higher energy intake. Yes, we might conduct tests uh, with different fiber contents. Yes, in a previous study we conducted, we had uh, added uh, byproducts uh, and the uh, Rabinox Island uh, content was four to five percent, which was low. So for this particular study, we increased 
the uh, fiber content in order to uh, see whether we had a greater effect and the Arabinox island content was total fibers was more 10 percent in order to challenge the enzymes as soon as you have the uh, answers for the rest uh, you could uh, give us the answers and the uh, what about the practical uh, use of the in vitro uh, test well the aim with the in vitro test uh, sometimes with enzymes you, there is no in vivo effect so the idea to do it in vitro was to check that the enzyme is really active and i also compared with my uh, diet in which uh, the uh, enzymes were added directly into the feed in the factory i just wanted to check whether what was observed in e vivo was due to the enzyme we wanted to make sure that the enzyme was actually work working operating correctly in the in vitro uh, example and degrading the the fibers do we have time for one more question would it be maybe even more efficient if we uh, did a pre-mix uh, liquid uh, feed uh, to uh, increase fermentation by mixing the feed at ambient temperature before giving it to the animals? Well, I guess that uh, the enzyme, as soon as it has a certain level of moisture, starts degrading the fibers even before the animal uh, ingests the diet. So yes, there might be an even increased effect by uh, pre-mixing, maybe it would release microorganisms uh, that would become present in the liquid feed. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next presentation and the next presentation will be testing a combination of multicarbohydrolases and phytases to improve uh, finishing pig's performances. Uh, Pierre Cosanet uh, from Adiseo. Bonjour et merci pour cette opportunité de présenter ce travail sur Good afternoon. Many thanks for this opportunity to present my work on the evaluation of a carbohydrolase phytase complex and its impact on the performance of growing pigs relative to the nutritional content of feed. By nutritional content, we mean the concentration in digestible amino acids in net energy and digestible phosphorus. This is how we describe the cost of a feed formula for pigs. Out of the three nutrients, net energy and digestible amino acids are the two main cost drivers. Together, they account for 66% of the cost or 33% of the cost respectively. So they interact and impact the performance of pigs. This is true for enzyme-based additives as well. So we thought it was interesting, and that's the goal of the study. We decided to evaluate the impact of each nutrient independently, the impact on performance. Also, we wanted to evaluate the impact of enzymes on animal performance and use modeling to convert the impact on performance into a net energy amino acid and digestible phosphorus concentration released by the complex, carbohydrolase phytase complex. So these are the results from eight tests, eight trials performed in six different stations and they have been aggregated and the studies were conducted on diets uh, made up of uh, wheat, corn, and soy meal. And in every test, we had a, a control diet, a positive control diet covering uh, animal requirements in line with NRC 2012 guidelines, as well as negative diets with a poorer nutrient content. So each diet was formulated on the basis of the same substrate. So we used arabinoxylane for the carbohydrolase component and we used phytic phosphorus for the phytase component. This led to a box banking design 
with three different levels of net energy, three levels of digestible amino acids, and three levels of digestible phosphorus. I will describe the amplitude range for each nutrient in a minute. So factor number four, we added enzymes. We added enzymes to the nutrient-reduced diets. So eight tests, 23 diet formulas, with or without enzyme supplementation. So the tests were conducted on a number of pens that varied from one test to another. And the tests included either males or both males and females. We performed a statistical analysis. This started with a variance analysis, followed by a nonlinear regression analysis using the SAS software. So we established a correspondence between the growth uh, uh, results, the FCR results, and the concentrations in net energy, in digestible lysine, and in digestible phosphorus, with and without enzymes. So the model is described later. Well, you can see the description of the model on the screen. So it's like a, a drawers type system. So the second line represents the relationship for the control uh, components, both for uh, gain and uh, both for gain and FCR and lines two and four, both for gain and for FCR with the presence of enzymes. So the impact of enzymes on the uh, nutrient uh, uh, concentration, so net energy, digestible lysine, and digestible phosphorus were materialized using the X, Y, Z variables who come in addition to the nutrient concentration of the native diets. Thanks to the variance analysis, we have been able to show strong variation in animal performance relative to the nutrient concentration. So by way of indication, as you can see, the index ranges between 2.4 and 3.2. And we're seeing a change in the impact of the enzyme. So these changes were materialized in two different colors. So green for the best case scenario and, uh, and red for the worst case situation. So for the index, the best situation or scenario uh, was a nine is a was a 6.3% uh, improvement and the worst case scenario, a deterioration to the tune of 0.4%. If we take a closer look at the uh, positive control diet, which repeated for every study, we find that the average performance observed was honorable. So 900 grams of ADG throughout the study period. So 2.5 kilogram, that's the daily voluntary intake. However, the performance, vary, the performance varied from one farm to another, from one station to another. Now the changes, the differences were, well, under control, 11% difference for ADG and intake and 9% difference for FCR. Now, in terms of modeling, The experiment had an impact which was taken as a fixed impact. So the ADG was predicted based on the net energy, digestive lysine, and digestible phosphorus concentrations in the diet. And FCR was predicted based on the digestible phosphorus and digestible lysine concentrations. The quality of the model is extremely satisfactory and the uh, coefficient for determination is higher than 0.98. Also, we find there's a good match between the observations and the predictions. 
both for ADG and for FCR. Like I said, when we incorporate the enzyme effect, we're able to uh, define X, Y, Z variables with the following values, 334 kilojoules per kilo for net energy, 0.04% points for digestible lysine and 0.15% points for digestible phosphorus. Meanwhile, there's still a significant difference between prediction and observations. So by way of conclusion, the study made it possible to uh, come up with a new method to evaluate the effect of uh, nutrient concentration and enzyme supplementation on animal performance. We've been able to demonstrate the impact of the enzyme on performance. On average, we're talking plus 20 grams per day in weight gain and 0 0.06 units in terms of the reduction in FCR. Now, this average effect of the enzyme depends on the nutrient content of each diet. In addition, we set up a mathematical model which made it possible to estimate the nutrients released by the enzyme. So by release, I'm referring to the following values, 334 kilojoules per kilo in net energy, 0.04% points for digestible lysine and 0.15% point for digestible phosphorus. Prospects, it could be a good idea to do this again. But as we do this again, we will expand the ranges of variation in nutrient and substrate content to look at uh, the response to feed. And also we want to repeat this type of design using diets with varying degrees of substrate concentration. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this presentation. Are there any questions? I have a question, says Natalie. I always have questions, as you all know. Well, obviously, when we do receive the papers, we spend a little bit of time checking the statistics, and you emphasize the fact that this new method for evaluating the effect on performance. Well, uh, please elaborate on the fact that there are no statistics in the table. Does that mean all the statistics are in the actual paper? The statistics are in the paper. Yes, we presented the equations individually. I, to tell the truth, I had a little bit of time presenting the statistical outputs of this type of model. Okay. Another question. Now, under study conditions, would you say that you can rear animals without phosphorus supplementation using a mineral diet? Well, it is true that for finishing pigs in particular, if we are to achieve reductions in phosphates of 0.015%, that means we are doing away with the entire mineral phosphorus content. I have a question regarding the rearing effect just for the fun of it, did you try and look at interactions? I don't actually know whether it's possible, but interactions between your different parameters that you try to estimate and the rearing effect? Well, no, I could not factor that in because I didn't have all of the combinations in all of the farms. Now we did have that opportunity for poultry. We did a similar design and we repeated absolutely everything in a single farm. Unfortunately, we cannot do this for pigs. But is that something we can imagine in the future? That the positive impact of the enzyme supplementation could could vary depending on husbandry practices, that there are rearing conditions and yes, absolutely. And that's something that I try to present. When you repeat a particular diet, a control diet in every single farm, 
this gives you an opportunity to see that well there, there are avenues we can explore that go, to, go along the same lines as what you said we have a question coming in regarding the statistics what is the confidence interval 95 percent of the enzyme impact on the uh, different concentrations, net energy, digestible lysine, and digestible phosphorus. The confidence interval for net energy was about 20 kilo. Another question. Oh, we do have another question regarding the values assigned, which depend on the amount of substrate selected. Yes, absolutely. We try to put together a diet that used uh, an intermediate uh, uh, substrate, so a little bit of corn and a little bit of grain. So another uh, possibility would be to use 100% grain or 100% corn to see whether or not this has an impact on uh, the impact of the enzyme. Is that is that something you're planning to do? Absolutely, that's in the pipeline. Okay. If there are no further questions, I suggest we, first of all, thank Pierre Cousinet for his talk and answers, and then we move on to the last presentation of the day. We're going to look at the impact of protein-enriched rapeseed meal, pelleting conditions, and enzyme supplementation in the growth performance of growing pigs. A presentation by Rosil Lizardo from IRTA. Bonjour. A continuación, je presentaré los resultados sobre la evaluación de. Now I would like to tell you about the relationship between uh, protein and rich uh, rapeseed meal uh, and uh, pelleting conditions for growing pigs. Uh, this was done within the feeder gene project uh, funded by the H2020 European uh, project uh, conducted within IRTA, but with the collaboration of a number of different partners. Soya bean meal imports represent 60% of the uh, protein rich raw materials used for animal feeding in Europe. The uh, world demand is increasing, therefore, more land is being uh, used to grow uh, soya bean, but this leads to deforestation and climate changes. The European Union is the first uh, world produ produ producer in the world for rapeseed meal and 35 to 40% uh, are not the same percentage between rapeseed and soya bean, but we think that maybe rapeseed could allow us to decrease the dependency on soya bean meal. Industrial processes are currently being developed, biological or mechanical, to increase the protein content of uh, rapeseed meal while reducing uh, anti-nutritional factors such as glucosinolate or fibers. On the other hand, incorporating enzymes in fe animal feed is now currently uh, done, uh, and maybe this uh, with rapeseed meal would improve digestion and zootechnical performances of the uh, breeding animals. The objective aim of our study was to assess in growing pigs the, the use of a European uh, protein-enriched rapeseed meal with a biological or mechanical process uh, adding enzymes in trial number one and changing the pelleting conditions in trial number two. Both tri two technical trials were conducted at IETA in Spain. The first one was uh, re realized with a vectorial experimental system two by three diets with uh, conventional rapeseed uh, diet, 35% crude protein and enriched uh, rapeseed meal plus 41% of crude protein in combination uh, with uh, enzyme supplementation. The meal was uh, French and the uh, selected batch was divided in two. Half of the batch was sent directly to ETA and the other half was sent to Denmark to be submitted to a biofermentation uh, process before being sent back 
to the uh, factory, the ETA factory where they make feed. Regarding enzymes, we're talking about protease and NSPAs uh, tested in vitro on rapeseed meal in Denmark, as again. Being thermolabile, it was uh, applied after pelleting uh, being sprayed directly on the pellets. Several batches of feed were manufactured at eight and with a ten, ten, eight, ten day interval between them uh, to avoid losing the activity of the enzymes uh, between the manufacturing processes. In the meantime, the enzymes were deep frozen and thawed on the very same day they were being used. They, we thought exactly the right quantity on the morning where we're going to uh, make the pellets. In the trial, we used 144 male and female pigs, uh, 35 kilos of lightweight uh, initially. Then they were divided in 12 blocks of live weight uh, before being assigned to 72 pens in the uh, fattening uh, building. So there were two animals per pen. The uh, trial lasted for six weeks approximately, and the animals were fed ad lib during the six week period. Towards the end, uh, we uh, took uh, feces uh, samples very early in the morning in order to determine uh, fecal digestibility of the nutrients fed to the animals. <laughs> Trial number two was designed according to a factorial two by two by two pattern, eight regimens uh, resulting from the combination of two types of uh, rapeseed meal, uh, conventional and uh, protein enriched, and two different pelleting conditions. We use two different uh, pelleting equipments, same diameter, but different length. And we tried to make the pellets with or without adding water steam. The uh, rapeseed meal was of German origin from Borghi, and uh, it was sent to Buhler to be submitted to a grinding and sieving process at 300 microns uh, in order to obtain a very thin uh, protein rich fraction. Then the, uh, so the rapeseed meal was sent to the ETA factory to be used to make the experimental feed. Like in the previous trial, we used 144 male and female animals. They were slightly lighter because they weighed 27 kilo in average. They were then divided after weighing in nine blocks, uh, according to the lightweight, and they were assigned to 72 pens. The trial lasted seven weeks. The animals were fed at lib, at lib. And towards the end, again, we uh, took some uh, feces samples in order to determine uh, fecal digestibility of the nutrients. The uh, diets were uh, cereal based, so maize, uh, barley, and uh, wheat. And the rapeseed meal was the main uh, source of protein. We also added uh, digestible amino acid. Uh, the uh, rapeseed meal incorporation rate was different in trial one. In trial two, we replaced the rapeseed meal quantity by quantity, that is, the diet with enriched rapeseed meal contain more amino digestible amino acids. Results. We did not observe any rapeseed meal related effect on animal growth. However, in the uh, enriched rapeseed meal group, the animals consumed less feed. Therefore, the conversion index was improved. And as far as the enzymes is concerned, uh, are concerned, we did not see any difference in the zootechnical performances. Di fecal digestibility, no uh, significant effect was observed uh, for the main nutrients, uh, energy, uh, nitrogen, uh, amylaceous uh, polysaccharides, both for rapeseed meal and also with enzyme incorporation. No, much of the country, we actually observed a, an obvious improve in mineral digestibility. And in trial two, we found a negative effect on the quality of the pellets themselves because not using uh, steam uh, independently of the uh, quantity of uh, rapeseed meal or the length of the equipment uh, made a difference. And the, the, the feed looked more like flour or meal than pellets. Results, we uh, clearly saw an improved uh, growth uh, performance and consumption uh, index, conversion index, both with the uh, enriched uh, rape seal um, rapeseed meal and the long uh, equipment. The steam uh, did not make any difference, but uh, we uh, found a uh, lesser 
consumption quantity, which means that the conversion index was improved. And this is probably due to the fact that there was uh, less uh, feed being wasted in the pens. The fecal digestibility was improved uh, for the nutrients uh, with the in protein enriched rapeseed meal. The length of the pelleting equipment did not seem to affect the results, but the steam, the use of steam seemed to decrease digestibility of all nutrients. In conclusion, adding a protein uh, to rapeseed meal by a biological or sieving process allows to improve the zootechnical performances and the digestive use of, uh, of the feed. Adding enzymes did not improve the digestibility results. Moreover, the pelleting conditions seem to play a fundamental role if we want to obtain a good quality pellets and good performances. Protein and rich rapeseed meal added to the uh, pellets uh, produced with steam in the longest equipment uh, is the uh, one that provides the better, the best results and the best performances. Based on these results, we may conclude that it might be useful to use uh, protein and rich rapeseed meal to reduce our dependence towards imports of uh, soya bean from uh, the American continent. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Rosil. I have a question on the additional cost of pelleting with rapeseed meal, because rapeseed already has undergone a thermal uh, processing uh, when oil is extracted. So what's the point of uh, what would be the consequences of uh, uh, another industrial process uh, adding to the fact that it has an impact on raw materials. Are you asking a question about cost or the fact that we uh, pellet the uh, rapeseed meal? Well, both. Well, actually, it was sieved. It was uh, ground and sieved, but not turned into a pellet. Regarding cost, well, I guess it would be an equivalent cost, except that the raw material after sieving is, is higher, obviously, after sieving. And uh, we need to factor in uh, that after sieving, the fraction is thinner, and we are left with the coarser part. We, what would we do with that? If we want it to be economically uh, viable, we have to find uh, something to do with the coarser part uh, left after sieving. And what about, uh, is there a difference in the flow in the pelleting equipment? Oh, we didn't, we didn't measure that. We didn't measure that. Maybe, maybe. Alors, oui, une précision, parce que tu as peut-être mis dans l'article, mais tu peux peut-être préciser. Maybe this is in the proceedings. Uh, were there phytases in the feed? No. No, no, we decided not to include phytases in order to avoid any collateral effect that could introduce a bias. However, in the... Um, In order to uh, increase uh, the protein content with biofermentation, enzymes here play a role. For instance, there could be an effect on phosphorus uh, release from the original rapeseed meal, which would explain the fact that phosphorus becomes uh, more digestible. David, we can't hear you. Mic's not on. Could you elaborate on the consequences of this uh, biological process being applied to the rapeseed meal? No, sorry, I can't. I can't. It's a patent pending, uh, so there is an intellectual property issue here. Okay, I'll rephrase my question. What do we expect from this type of fermentation? Does it change the amino acid profile? That's what, I mean, you talked about the enzyme, enzymatic activity that releases uh, some compounds. What exactly is happening? 
Regarding the amino acid profile, it was um, more or less similar. So it's mainly the uh, crude protein content that increases based on our observations. But we did not push this any further. We did not look exactly at the uh, mineral content uh, in some raw materials. We did look, that, look at that in the uh, diet itself, in the feed, but not in the raw materials. Could you tell us which enzymes were used? The enzymes, uh, prototype enzymes. I call them prototype enzymes. No, I can't. Proteases, different kinds of proteases different candida, they were tested in, with a, a protein solubilization test. And the proteases that provided uh, the best results were chosen for the in vivo test. For the NSPases, the same. The tests uh, consisted in observing uh, amylaceous polysaccharide disappearance and those that gave the best results on meals and only meals, rapeseed meals were the ones that were chosen for the test, for the uh, trials, but I, I don't know anything else. And uh, the fact that you observed no differences, uh, maybe it was your system powerful enough for you to observe differences? Well, we did see some interaction If we leave aside the, the treatment with NSPases and proteases, and we only look at the control diets uh, with the, and the ones with proteases, we see a slight improvement. However, it's not statistically significant. And that was a bit of a disappointment. Maybe with more repetitions, we would have gotten there. I don't know. We'll never, we'll never know. You, you always think about, you always think you might, but uh, why, well, if you can't get the risk first two species, uh, you don't know. Well, thank you. Any more questions? No more questions? I think we've um, covered all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosil, for your presentation. It's time to close the uh, session. It was a very uh, long session. We reached a peak of audience uh, mid-afternoon, uh, approximately 300 people were following the presentations. That's quite a uh, good result. I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, for outstanding presentations. And also I would like to thank you for the questions and that made for a very interesting discussion. Nathalie and Ludovic, thank you for helping me manage the questions. A few words of conclusion. I mean, I don't want to go over everything that has been said, but there are a couple of things that I would like to highlight all the presentations regarding uh, reproductive and breeding sows, we see that a lot still needs to be done to improve uh, feeding uh, management uh, over the whole career, taking into consideration the variability of their needs, nutritional needs, but functional needs also in terms of health and well-being, and uh, high variability during gestation and lactation shows that we uh, could, uh, we stand to gain a lot if we uh, can improve the management. We also heard several presentations regarding uh, pigs and sows, pointing to the fact that uh, reduced uh, feed intake and means that we have to uh, look into raw materials, how the raw materials are processed, how the animals are fed, the conditions in which the animals are housed, and the animal's capacity to make up for depletion periods. Uh, we had a very good example with the, the phosphorus depletion repletion study. Also something else I'd like to uh, lay the emphasis on. Recently, we have seen an increasing number of studies regarding uh, the use of enzymes. 
Enzymes are now a part of our toolbox when uh, we formulate diets because they allow us to improve digestibility and maybe to improve uh, the balance of an, an unbalanced diet. And as we heard from several presentations, the uh, effects are sometimes uh, quite substantial, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't really work as we expected, which means there is uh, still a lot that we need to figure out, understand, uh, and, uh, and to understand the role of PNAs and uh, the best way to formulate the ration, the, the, the diet. That's it. By way of conclusions, thank you very much for participating in the uh, in this session on feeding. Uh, have a nice evening and uh, see you tomorrow for the next session. Bye bye. Merci David pour cette conclusion. À demain tout le monde. C'était bien, super. Ouais, bon, c'est bon. Ah ouais. Rendez-vous même heure pour l'économie sociologie. J'avais oublié en fait que c'était économie sociologie. Je te rappelais plus. <rire> et l'environnement en fin de en fin d'après-midi. Voilà, très bien. Très bien. À bon. demain tout le monde. Bonne soirée à tous. Merci, Merci à tous. Soirée. À demain. Claude, pour pour oui. demain pour la pour la session environnement, on se retrouve aussi à. Alors à euh, vers. Oui, 12h45, ça nous laisse voilà. largement le temps voilà, de, de faire l'appel et voilà. voilà. On sera tous ensemble.